A following 911 call went through from the same phone requesting help. No, Nick. No. Nick. Stay on the phone with me. Who shot you? I am a son of a bitch in that house. No. Okay, stay on the phone with me, okay? Do not hang up. It was Heidi's 27 year old husband, Nicholas Furcus. State Patrol 911. Someone's trying to break into my home. What city are you in? St. Paul? I'm in St. Paul. What address are you at? 1794. 1794 what? 17. 1794. Minnehaha Avenue. Minnehaha. Yeah. Someone's trying west? The distressed voice you just heard belonged to 25-year-old Heidi Furcus, who would tragically succumb to death mere minutes after, on this fateful day of April 25, 2010, when police finally reached their home at the 1700 block of West Minnehaha Avenue in Minnesota. They found Heidi lying dead from a single gunshot wound. Who was the intruder Heidi was referring to, and what exactly went down in the home? Situated along the banks overlooking the mighty Mississippi River, St. Paul stands as a prominent regional business hub and serves as the center of Minnesota's government. With a population of over 300,000, St. Paul is known as the Twin City to its larger neighbor, Minneapolis. Matching the vibrance of its residents, St. Paul fully embraces the full spectrum of the four seasons, from mild summers to brisk winters. But what truly adds to the fun and excitement of St. Paul is its widely acclaimed brewery scene which has garnered the city the esteemed title of the beer capital of Minnesota. So, amidst this idyllic setting, when a deadly home invasion took place in 2010, residents were not quite ready to deal with it. Heidi Marie Erickson's journey on this earth began in Roseville, Minnesota, where she was born to her parents, John and Linda Erickson, on December 14, 1984. With two brothers, Peter and Joel, Heidi was the youngest of three children. The Erickson family moved to Falcon Heights in Minnesota when Heidi was just a little girl, and that's where she grew up. Their home fostered a loving atmosphere where deep bonds were shared, and Heidi particularly admired her two older brothers. Heidi had a passion for painting and frequently expressed her affection for loved ones through beautifully crafted artistic cards. Heidi also excelled academically, but her talents extended beyond the realm of studies. She actively participated in basketball and tennis at school and also engaged in choral music. In 2003, she successfully graduated from Roseville Area High School and went on to attend what is now the University of Northwestern in Roseville. Church has always been a big part of Heidi's life, having regularly attended with her family as she grew up. Those who knew Heidi said she committed her life to God. After high school, her involvement in the church grew even stronger. She became the youth group leader at the Calvary Church in Roseville and even undertook numerous mission trips. It was at the Calvary Church in Roseville where Heidi Marie Erickson crossed paths with Nicholas Furcus, who served as another youth group leader. Similar to Heidi, Nick also spent his childhood in Minnesota. His parents Steve and Julie Furcus were devout members of the Calvary Church as well. So when 18-year-old Heidi started dating 20-year-old Nick in August 2003, it was a match made in heaven. Heidi's family was all in for her happiness. Nick appeared to be an upright young man, and John and Linda were only too glad to bless the couple. In 2005, after nearly two years of dating, Heidi and Nick tied the knot. After marriage, they settled down in St. Paul, Minnesota. They were a genuinely happy couple who were deeply in love. Beyond their commitment within the church, the newlyweds found joy in partaking in various outdoor pursuits such as camping, hiking, and biking. In August 2007, the couple purchased a house located at 1794 West Minnehaha Avenue in St. Paul. They moved into their new home the following month. With Nick taking charge of the financial responsibilities, Heidi, with her artistic sensibilities, poured her efforts into decorating and designing the space. It was like a fresh start, a promising new beginning for their life together. By 2010, Heidi and Nick had settled into a seemingly ordinary life. Nick held the position of Director of Operations at Crew 2 ChemDry, a carpet cleaning company, while Heidi worked at Securian, a financial services firm. Additionally, she devoted her time as a Sunday school teacher. Unbeknownst to anyone around them, 
their lives were in the abyss of an unforeseen tragedy that would irreversibly alter their life. On the morning of Sunday, August 25, 2010, 911 dispatch received a frantic call from Heidi Furcus that someone was trying to break into the home on Minnehaha Avenue in St. Paul. State Patrol 911. Someone's trying to break into my home. What city are you in, St. Paul? I'm in St. Paul. What address are you at? 1794. 1794 what? 17, 1794. Minnehaha Avenue. Minnehaha, someone's trying west? Less than a minute into the call, a piercing scream reverberated through the line, only to be followed by an abrupt silence as the connection was lost. Despite multiple efforts, the attempts to reestablish contact proved unsuccessful. However, approximately two minutes later, Another call was received from the same phone, with Nicholas Furcus on the line, who was desperate for help. State Patrol 911. Okay, are you in St. Paul, sir? Okay, hold. Let, let me get you right in there. Hold on one second. Okay, hold on. Hold on a sec. As Nick desperately conveyed the harrowing news that both he and his wife had been shot, the police were already en route to the residence. No, Nick? No, no. Nick? No. Stay on the phone with me. Who shot you? I don't know. Someone broke into that house. No! Okay, stay on the phone with me, okay? Do not hang up. Upon entering the residence, the St. Paul police immediately observed that the front door was slightly ajar. A distinct odor of gunpowder lingered in the air, growing increasingly potent as they made their way toward the kitchen area. In the kitchen, Heidi Furcus lay motionless on her back, her feet positioned towards the entrance. Traces of blood stained her hair and face, and she remained unresponsive. Meanwhile, Nick was situated beside her, engaged in conversation with the 911 operator. He had an apparent gunshot wound to his upper left leg. Adjacent to the front door, a shotgun rested on the floor, while visible damage on the lower section of the interior door indicated the impact of shotgun pellets. Although Nick was overwhelmed by intense emotions, he was able to provide a description of the events that transpired that fateful morning. He told police that he and his wife were peacefully asleep in their upstairs bedroom on that Sunday morning. Around 6 a.m., he woke up and proceeded downstairs to quench his thirst with a glass of water. Shortly after returning to bed, while still awake, he heard sounds indicating someone attempting to open their front door at approximately 6.30 a.m. Alarmed by this, Nick promptly awakened Heidi and told her to call 911. As she was talking to the 911 operator, he armed himself with a shotgun from the closet, and they prepared to run out the back door to the detached garage to escape. Afterward, they both made their way downstairs. At that precise moment when they reached the bottom of the stairs, the door swung open revealing a stranger standing before them. A struggle ensued between the intruder and Nick, while Heidi ran towards the back door. Tragically amidst the chaos, a gunshot was discharged, striking Heidi in the back. Nick further explained that he and the assailant wrestled over the shotgun, resulting in another gunshot being fired, this time injuring Nick in the leg. He fell to the ground and the intruder seized the opportunity to flee through the front door. However, Nick was unable to provide a detailed description of the intruder. He was unsure that they were black or white, but he did mention that the individual was wearing a hoodie. After the initial statement, Nick was taken to the hospital where he was treated for the gunshot wound. Sadly, Heidi was pronounced dead at the scene. Interestingly, despite the fatal attack that took place, no apparent signs of a home invasion were evident within the house. The front door of the house had two locks, a deadbolt lock and a lower lock. Tool marks were found on the door jamb near the lower lock, but none on the deadbolt. A table positioned just inside the door contained various items, including a beer bottle, a water bottle, and a receipt. But none of these items appeared to be disturbed or displaced. Moreover, nothing was stolen from the house. There was no sign in the house that indicated that a violent struggle had taken place there. The autopsy revealed the extensive severity of Heidi's injuries. She had suffered a single shotgun wound to her back, which entered from the right side and pierced her posterior vertebral column, left ribs, left lung, and anterior ribs. 
On a contrasting note, Nick's injury was deemed non-life-threatening. He sustained a through-and-through -through gunshot wound to his upper left thigh, resulting in no significant bleeding or substantial injury beyond localized damage to the soft tissues. However, emotionally, Nick was still in a deeply distressed state. Throughout the entire ordeal, he appeared hysterical. After receiving appropriate medical treatment, Nick was discharged from the hospital after approximately three hours. Meanwhile, the St. Paul police initiated multiple interviews in the neighborhood, inquiring whether anyone had observed or heard anything unusual or out of the ordinary during the time of the incident. One neighbor reported hearing the sound of a car screeching through the streets at approximately 6.20 a.m. The witness described the vehicle leaving the area in a hurry. Another neighbor claimed to have heard a loud noise around the same time, coinciding with the moment Nick placed the 911 call for assistance. However, oddly, this neighbor stated they did not hear any gunshots. With a multitude of unanswered questions lingering, the police were eager to have another conversation with Nick. After being discharged from the hospital, Nicholas Furcus underwent another interview, this time adding a lot more details. You know, I know this is a very traumatic situation, okay, and I'm just going to try and ease into it, okay? okay. So what, gonna, what, what I'd like to do is just try to kind of backtrack a little bit, you know, try and go back maybe 24 hours or so. Yeah. Um, what time do you think you went to sleep at? I probably went to sleep about 12, 12, 15. And then when you went to bed, or before you went to bed, did you... Did you lock up the house or anything? Or? Yeah, I mean, we were pretty religious on uh, throwing bolts and locking up the house because... You're sleeping. Mm -hmm. And then what happens next time? Well, because I get up for work about 6 every morning, Yeah, I kind of got up, but we didn't need to be up until about 9 to go to church. So I got up and went and got a glass of water uh, from the bathroom. Okay, so you woke up a what time? You about 6 a.m. So you're up around 6 a.m., go to the bathroom, get some, get some water. Yep, go back to sleep, but just kind of fitfully sleep for 10 or 15 minutes, and then I hear our... I heard the screen door open. What I did is um, kind of let it go for a little while, but then I started hearing, fiddling with our doorknob. So what I did is I, I grabbed my shotgun out of the closet. Okay, so you're hearing these noises, someone's... You know, kind of monkeying around the door downstairs. Mm -hmm. You go to the closet and grab the shotgun. Mm -hmm. And then I wake up Heidi. Okay. And I... She's, uh... When she, when she gets woken up from the sleep, she gets startled. Yeah. In general. And I, I said, Heidi, somebody's fiddling with our knob and trying to get into our house. Let's let's get your shoes on and let's go out to the garage. Let's get out of here. And we just wanted... We didn't want to be in the house if somebody was trying to get Okay. And so I said, call 911, and then let's head to the garage. Okay. And so I try to shut the door shut, but it gets forced open. And the guy that was there, uh, I think he saw it. Yeah. He, I think he, he grabbed the barrel. And what did this guy look like? He's a white guy, black guy, Asian guy? I think he was a black guy with a dark hooded sweatshirt that was drawn. I, if I remember right, it was drawn up pretty tight. Yeah. But I did not get a good look because I was looking for Heidi. Yeah. And trying to wrestle the gun away so we could bail. I don't remember exactly what happened, but the gun went off. So my fingers slipped out. Despite Nick's cooperation, the detectives harbored lingering doubts regarding the honesty of his account. At one point, the detective confronted Nick directly, asking him point blank if he had any involvement with his wife's untimely death. Why is there a party that wants to ask that? Well, Nick, I'm a, I'm a police officer, okay? Yeah. I gotta ask. Nick denied having anything to do with Heidi's death. He reassured the detective, saying they had shared a happy marriage. Which is a little stressful. In fact, we were planning on moving tomorrow. Uh, moving where? Well, we hadn't figured that out yet. We were, and, and this is a, a hard, it's a hard place for us. Uh, we were foreclosing on our, we foreclosed on our house. Okay. We have to be out by Monday. Tomorrow, one of the reasons I brought the van home was also because it has a trailer hitch. I was going to go back to the office and grab a trailer. Um, so you'd be out by Monday? We'd be out by Monday. We've been, this has been kind of a private struggle for us, so we were going to move as much of our stuff into the garage as we possibly could. Okay. And then start taking stuff to a storage place and then either crash at 
we hadn't ran it by our folks yet, but we were gonna kind of talk to everybody about it tomorrow and crash at their place or get a hotel and find a place to live. Well, that's kind of, I mean, kind of close notice. It is, and I think the reason is because we're both kind of dealing with the shame of the whole thing because um, we're embarrassed. Um, the, I think that one of the challenges is um, that we haven't been able to be honest with our friends about our struggles. Yeah. And, and, um, and it's, not be, it's not to discredit. Though Nick had acknowledged that they were having financial troubles, nobody had anticipated the secret he was about to reveal. He disclosed that he and Heidi had fallen behind on their bills, resulting in their home being foreclosed upon. In fact, the imminent eviction was scheduled for the very next day. What made the revelation even more startling was the fact that they had kept this awful situation hidden from their friends and family. Nick confessed that their plan was to pack up their belongings on Sunday and Monday morning, store some items in the garage temporarily, and seek temporary accommodation with someone they knew. Additionally, he claimed that there had been fraudulent activity in their bank account. The disclosure of this bombshell revelation left the police astounded, and their immediate focus shifted toward verifying the truthfulness of Nick's claims. As the police delved deeper into the investigation, troubling aspects began to emerge regarding the situation of the young couple. They discovered that back in 2007, Nick and Heidi purchased their home for $250,000, utilizing two mortgages. The primary mortgage carried a monthly payment of approximately $1,300, while the second mortgage had a monthly payment of around $250. However, the last payment made on either mortgage was on September 22, 2008, almost two years before the murder. Following their failure to meet mortgage obligations, Nick received foreclosure documents on April 30, 2009. These documents were located in Nick's car during a search. The detectives further learned that on June 4, 2009, the house was sold at a sheriff's auction. On January 29, 2010, a representative from the law firm handling the foreclosure made a telephone offer to Nicholas Furcus, proposing $4,000 in cash if they vacated the premises by February 18, 2010, or $2,500 if they vacated by March 20, 2010. However, Nick did not accept either offer. Eviction proceedings were initiated on February 12, 2010, and an eviction hearing was held on March 8, 2010. Surprisingly, Nicholas Furcus attended the hearing alone, in Heidi's absence. Eventually, Nick signed an agreement to vacate the house by March 22, 2010. However, when the Furcuses failed to comply by the specified date, the law firm sent Nicholas Furcus a letter setting a lockout date of April 9, 2010. On April 6, 2010, just three days before the scheduled eviction date, Nick contacted the law firm claiming that his grandmother was in hospice on her deathbed, thus requesting a few extra weeks to vacate the property. The law firm agreed and rescheduled the lockout for Monday, April 26, 2010. In reality, there was no evidence suggesting either of Nick's grandmothers were in hospice during that time. But what raised further doubts was the lack of preparation made for an eviction. Despite being aware of the impending need to vacate the property, there were no signs of any packing or preparations being made. Pictures were still on the wall. The fridge was stocked with food. Clothes were neatly folded in the dresser, and no furniture was moved. There were not even any boxes or any sort of luggage anywhere in the house to suggest that they had started packing. Detectives discovered that Nick and Heidi's troubles were not limited to housing issues. The couple had been living well beyond their means and were burdened by substantial financial difficulties. They had numerous unpaid utility bills and credit card bills. At the time of Heidi's death, they owed the U.S. Bank a total of $1,736.31. Additionally, an REI credit card had an outstanding balance of $17,381.66. A review of the credit card charges from 2008 to 2009 showed that Nicholas Furcus made 2.4 times more charges on their credit cards compared to Heidi. As the investigators worked to assemble the pieces of the puzzle, a growing realization became evident. Heidi may have been kept in the dark about their dire financial situation, including the foreclosure. Heidi's family said they heard nothing about a foreclosure until the day after she was killed. They believed that Heidi did not know anything about the eviction either. According to them, Nick was solely responsible for managing the household and handling their finances. Heidi's understanding of their financial matters was limited to what Nick had communicated to her. 
and he intentionally concealed the information. Heidi's parents shared that the months leading up to her untimely death, Heidi had confided in them about an issue with her and Nick's bank account. While the exact nature of the problem remained unclear to her parents, Heidi expressed her frustration, mentioning that the bank had somehow mishandled their account. Though Heidi's family didn't know about a lot of things that were going on with Heidi and Nick, they were aware that the couple had been actively searching for a new home. Heidi had mentioned to her parents that they were considering the possibility of renting a temporary place. Nick was also present during this conversation, but he remained silent. In the weeks leading up to her death, she had discussed the idea of a short sale for their current home. This is usually a sign of a financially distressed homeowner who needs to sell the property before the lender seizes it in a foreclosure. However, according to her parents, the motivation behind this decision was not due to their financial strain. Heidi expressed her desire to become a mother, but did not wish to start their family in the current home due to safety concerns related to the steep staircase and her unease about the neighborhood. In reality, by that point, they did not have any house to sell due to the foreclosure. All of these revelations strongly suggested the possibility that Heidi was unaware of the extent of the financial troubles they were facing. Heidi's family was certain that if she had been aware of any significant problems, she would have confided in them or sought their assistance. Many of the couple's friends said that despite their appearance of an extravagant lifestyle, there was an underlying sense of stress surrounding the Fergus couple. However, Heidi seemed oblivious to this stress and unaware of any financial troubles that may have been brewing, perhaps due to her naive nature. One of Heidi's friends went shopping with her on the day before her death, on Saturday, April 24, 2010. The friend told the investigators that Heidi did not appear upset or nervous about their financial situation. In fact, she was looking to buy a dress for a friend's upcoming wedding. Heidi had also made plans for Sunday which was extremely odd given the fact that their eviction was scheduled for the same day. All of these accounts raised suspicions about Nick's credibility. In search of any solid evidence, detectives conducted a thorough examination of the text messages and emails exchanged between Heidi and Nick. However, they found no messages referencing foreclosure, eviction proceedings, or any indication that they would eminently need to vacate their house. On the contrary, a message sent by Heidi to a friend on March 11, 2010, expressed a desire for relocation if they were not tied down by their current house. The law firm handling the foreclosure and eviction had no documentation signed by Heidi, and their representatives had never been in direct contact with her. All interactions and communications were solely with Nick. Furthermore, in the emails from March and April 2010, Heidi repeatedly requested Nick to handle and respond to these calls indicating that she was receiving them. In response, Nick reassured her that he was taking care of it and mentioned being in contact with U.S. Bank regarding an audit involving fraud with their account. He also assured Heidi that their credit scores were good. In reality, the bank never conducted any such audit, nor was there any fraud related to the Fergus's account. Even with this seemingly incriminating evidence, what made the case all the more perplexing was the absence of a clear motive. Detectives thoroughly investigated Nick's financial accounts in search of any possible leads, but they found no evidence of him benefiting from Heidi's death, whether monetarily or otherwise. Taking another approach to this puzzling case, detectives reconstructed the invasion to observe whether it was possible to hear the jingling sound at the front door from the upstairs bedroom. 6, 16 a.m. April 27, 2010. We're in the bedroom looking at the hallway. April 27th, 2010. All right, um, I'm at the front door, so let me know when you guys are ready. I'll, I'll try to knock for 15 seconds then. Okay, here we go. We're moving to the bathroom. Okay, we're in the bathroom by the bathroom sink looking at All right. Okay. And then I'll come on in and shake it. All right. Landy. Okay, we're at the, on the second floor landing looking at the front door. Unfortunately, the test did not yield any significant findings. The lack of development was disappointing, 
but authorities continued their efforts to uncover the truth. Throughout the investigation, the police maintained contact with Nick, and he was cooperative for the most part. He willingly provided his DNA samples and answered their questions. However, a few weeks later, Nick decided to hire a lawyer, Joe Friedberg, who advised him to cease communication with the police. Friedberg alleged that Nick had been mistreated by the police, emphasizing that Nick was a victim and a grieving widower, rather than a suspect. As a result, when the police approached Nick with more probing inquiries, he declined to respond to any of them, following the advice of his attorney. To the astonishment of everyone involved, the investigation took a significant turn when Nick's lawyer, Joe Friedberg, reached out to the police. He presented them with the sketch of the alleged intruder, which had been crafted with the assistance of a private artist. Detectives found it peculiar that Nick and his lawyer had sought the assistance of a random artist instead of utilizing the professional services of the police sketch artist. The police became even more skeptical when they compared Nick's initial claim of not getting a good look at the intruder with the level of detail present in the release sketch. The illustration depicted a middle-aged man with a dark complexion, big eyes, and wearing a hoodie. Despite their suspicion, the authorities decided to give Nick the benefit of the doubt. In an effort to potentially identify the alleged intruder, the police released the sketch to the media, and soon they found a lead. The sketch looked familiar to St. Paul police. Approximately four months earlier, the police had been involved in a high-profile case involving a series of break-ins during the morning hours where the homeowners were present during the incidents. These crimes had garnered significant media attention at the time. The police realized that they might be dealing with the same individual and focused their efforts on linking the two cases together. The intruder was a man named Michael Lee Pye. But there was just one problem. Michael Pye couldn't have been involved in Heidi's murder because he was already in prison when she was killed. He was arrested on January 1st, 2010 for the series of burglaries. The St. Paul police still interviewed Pye and subsequently ruled him out as a suspect. Detectives theorized that Nick Furkus may have seen Pye's face in the media coverage and concocted a story implicating him as the intruder, but theories alone couldn't prove Nick's guilt. So, the investigators waited for something more substantial, the forensic reports. The forensic report yielded some intriguing findings. The ballistic analysis of the bullets revealed that both shots were fired from Nick's shotgun, confirming his statement regarding the weapon used in the incident. However, the bullet trajectory of Heidi's gunshot wound did not align with the account provided by Nick. But the biggest finding was the absence of unidentified DNA on both the murder weapon and the crime scene. The only DNA they could find either belonged to Heidi or Nick. This led them to consider the possibility that there might not have been an intruder involved, but rather the crime was perpetrated from within. But what could Nick Farkas possibly gain from his wife's murder? Detectives couldn't help but wonder if Nick had deceived Heidi for an extended period, painting a false picture of a stable and prosperous life. Heidi may have discovered the truth about their financial turmoil, or she was very close to doing so. Perhaps driven by fear or desperation, he had resorted to drastic measures to maintain the illusion he had created for Heidi. However, these were all speculations, and authorities still lacked enough conclusive evidence to tie Nick Furkus to the crime. As the days turned into months, Heidi's family had to move on with their life. However, they continued to advocate for justice. Unfortunately, the investigation seemed to have reached a standstill, leaving many frustrated and disheartened. Some staunchly believed in Nick's innocence, firmly convinced that an intruder was responsible for Heidi's tragic death. On the other hand, some believed that Nick had a hand in Heidi's murder. Over the years, the St. Paul police made repeated attempts to contact Nick, seeking his cooperation and assistance in the investigation. However, Nick showed no interest in engaging with the authorities and even requested them to stop reaching out to him. His lawyer, Friedberg, consistently asserted that the police had exaggerated the financial troubles faced by the Furcus couple. According to him, their law firm had thoroughly examined the accounts and concluded that the situation was not as dire as portrayed by the police. Media personnel also tried to reach out to Nick for interviews or statements, but their attempts were met with little success as well. As time went on without any significant breakthroughs, the case gradually turned cold. Though authorities never ruled Nick out as a possible suspect, 
he was also never officially declared as a suspect. Meanwhile, Nick had moved on with his life too. Just three months after Heidi's death, Nick met another woman, Rachel Watson, and used his recent tragedy as a means to win her affection. Coincidentally, Rachel got to know Nick on a personal level through her sister, Sarah, who had shared a close friendship with Heidi. Believing that Nick was the man of her dreams, Rachel started a romantic relationship with him. Sarah, too, held the belief that she was the one for Nick, considering him a remarkable man who had loved and faithfully cared for his wife. In August 2012, after almost a year of dating, Rachel and Nick exchanged vows. The couple went on to have a happy marriage, and they eventually became the proud parents of three wonderful children. They soon moved into a house that was purchased by Nick Ferkus's parents. This arrangement was made due to Nick's poor credit score at the bank. Nick and Rachel agreed to make monthly mortgage payments to Nick's parents, while Nick took on the responsibility of paying the property taxes directly to the county. Everything was going well, until Rachel stumbled upon a notice indicating that they were at risk of losing their home to foreclosure due to unpaid property taxes. Rachel's mind immediately drew a connection to Heidi's death. She couldn't help but recall the last time Nick faced a similar situation. It resulted in an unfortunate event. After this incident, Nick, Rachel's husband, and the father of her children became someone she no longer recognized. Did you fear for your life? There were times that I did, for sure. With knowing that he could do it once, what makes you think he can't do it again? Ultimately, one day she decided to confront him and record the conversation. The conversation went this way. You decided you wanted to record the conversation? Yeah. Why? Because I didn't know what was going to happen in that conversation, and possibly, maybe there'd be a confession of some sort. I could get through this if it was just the lying. I really could. The problem is the Heidi stuff. That's my problem. The problem is I don't 100% believe you. I don't have words, Rach. It is too traumatic. And I don't know what else to tell you. The fact that your lying was so easy for you to do in front of me over and over and over makes me think... That I could murder my wife. That you could lie about something. That I could murder my wife. Yes. Although Nick didn't confess to anything, Rachel was genuinely scared to stay with him. The constant worry consumed Rachel to the point where she could no longer bear it. Finally, in 2019, the couple got a divorce. In that same year, Sergeant Nicole Sipes of the St. Paul Police Department decided to re-examine the case of Heidi Ferkus's death. Sipes contacted the FBI to help reconstruct the 911 call audio data to determine Sipes contacted the FBI to help reconstruct the 911 call audio data to determine if there was evidence of a third person in the home. The analysis of the 911 call highlighted a few concerns. In Heidi's 911 call, there was no indication of a struggle or any mention of an intruder who had gained entry into the house. Her call did not provide any evidence to support Nick's claim of a home invasion. Yet during Nick's 911 call, which came in just a minute later, the sounds of police arriving at the scene can be heard in the background. This raised doubts about the timeline and the accuracy of Nick's account. The FBI also compared the ballistics test results with a virtual model of Heidi and Nick Ferkus's home to further investigate the nature of the shots fired. The analysis suggested the likelihood that the gunshots fired during the incident were intentional rather than accidental. Upon learning about Nick Ferkus's recent divorce from his second wife, Sergeant Nicole Sipes contacted Rachel Furcus. Rachel shared her suspicions with Sipes, providing additional insight into the case. Sipes believed Rachel Furcus could have also been a victim in the same manner as Heidi if she had gotten out in time. Just three years later, the case experienced an unexpected breakthrough. Combining the new evidence with the previous findings, the St. Paul police had accumulated enough substantial evidence to charge Nick Furcus with the murder of his former wife. After years of investigation in May 2021, almost a decade after Heidi's tragic killing, Nick Ferkus was arrested at his residence in Mounds View, Minnesota, and was booked in the Ramsey County Jail. Nicholas Ferkus's trial began in January 2023 in Ramsey County District Court. For prosecutors Elizabeth Lamon and Rachel Craker, it was the most high-profile case of their careers. Along with presenting the other evidence, the prosecutors presented a possible timeline of events on the day of the murder to the jurors. Their theory was that on August 25, 2010, around 6.30 a.m., Nick had awakened Heidi, claiming to have heard an intruder. 
Heidi, still sleepy and frightened, followed him downstairs. He made her call 911 to make the story more credible. It was at that moment when Heidi turned her back that Nick shot her. Afterward, he shot himself in the leg and made up the intruder story to the authorities. During the trial, Prosecutor Lamon argued, Nick was desperate and ashamed and had run out of time, and reality was going to come crashing down on him. However, defense attorney Richmond disagreed with the prosecutor's theory of a motive. He questioned the notion asking whether a loving husband would kill the person who everyone agreed was the love of his life to spare himself from momentary embarrassment about a foreclosure. He would have survived the embarrassment far more easily than the death of his wife, Richmond added. Richmond also pointed out that there was no financial gain for Nicholas to kill Heidi. However, it wasn't enough to convince the jury. The jurors believed in Nick's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. On February 10, 2023, after four hours of deliberations, the jury found Nick Furkus guilty of murder. For all of us, it is impossible that Nick could ever have done what he is accused of doing. We believe him, and we believe in his innocence. On April 13, 2023, almost 13 years after Heidi's death, he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. During the victim impact statement after the conviction, Heidi's brother, Peter Erickson, conveyed that their family struggled to find closure and come to terms with the tragic loss of Heidi due to the lies that were told and the pressures to believe them. The realization quickly set in that everything Nick was telling us betrayed who I knew my sister to be, Peter added. For his part, Nick Fergus maintained his innocence and denied committing the murder. While I understand the jury's verdict, and the sentence you must give. I do maintain and will maintain to my dying breath my innocence of this crime. He also declared, my body is condemned to serve for another man's crime, but my soul is free. The conviction brought a sense of solace to Heidi's parents, John and Linda Erickson. They expressed their gratitude to all the people who had worked tirelessly for justice throughout the years. Heidi Fergus's gravestone bears the inscription, Joyful Child of God a description that beautifully captures the essence of Heidi's spirit. Instead of grief overshadowing our every memory, we believe it will now take its proper place alongside all the goodness, joy, and beauty God brought into our lives through the gift of Heidi, shared Heidi's parents. The 1980s marked a period of growth and development in Tampa Bay, Florida. In 1989, Tampa was already a popular tourist destination with beautiful beaches and diverse attractions like Busch Gardens and the Salvador Dali Museum. The region experienced economic growth with sectors such as tourism, agriculture, shipping, and manufacturing contributing to its prosperity. And amidst this prosperous tourism hotspot, some tourists noticed three dead bodies floating in the sea on June 4, 1989. Joan Jo Rogers was born on November 12, 1952, to Wilhelm and Virginia Etzler. Later, she married Hal Rogers, and they settled on a farm in Wilshire, Ohio, living an idyllic life. On February 22, 1972, their first daughter, Michelle, was born. And on October 6, 1974, their second daughter, Christy, was born. Hal and Joe Rogers regularly took good care of their animals. Their daughters, Michelle and Christy, loved the animals on the farm and found great joy in their happy life, despite the hard work on the farm. Michelle, even though she had some tough times, she always looked out for Christy. They both went to school, and Michelle had a boyfriend named Jeff Beesby. However, Michelle had been through something terrible involving her uncle John, Hal's brother, who had once blindfolded Michelle and assaulted her. Hal and Joe didn't know about it until the police arrested John for attacking another woman from the same town. Due to the disturbing things Michelle had seen, she was very protective of her baby sister. Christy was a bubbling and outgoing girl. She was a cheerleader, loved softball, and was very close to her father. She looked up to Michelle, even though they had their arguments as sisters do. Michelle was sometimes jealous of the attention Christy got from their father, but despite her struggles, Michelle always cared for her little sister. The family faced many challenges on the farm, but Joe was the strongest. She worked long hours at two jobs and took care of the family and the animals. She was often exhausted, but she never stopped working. On Friday, May 26, 1989, 36-year-old Joe Rogers and her two daughters, 17-year-old Michelle and 15-year-old Christy, went on a long-awaited road trip to Florida. They left their farm in Ohio and were looking forward to enjoying a family vacation. Joe, who worked the night shift at a distribution center, 
was excited to give her girls their first vacation. They left Joe's husband, Hal, to take care of the farm and drove their Oldsmobile Calais south on Interstate 75. Their plans included visiting theme parks and enjoying the Florida sun. They visited the Jacksonville Zoo, Silver Springs, SeaWorld, Epcot, and Disney's MGM Studios, having a great time away from farm responsibilities. On June 1st, they reached the motel in Tampa and were thinking about going to Bush Gardens. Michelle called her boyfriend, Jeff, to have a conversation with him. At 12.57 p.m., the family made another call to Bush Gardens. At night, the Rogers women were seen happily dining at the motel's restaurant by a businessman. But after that evening, they mysteriously disappeared. The last photo they took in their motel was Michelle getting ready for their next adventure. Sadly, they never got to see the sunrise again. Hal Rogers anxiously waited for Joe and his daughters to return from their Florida vacation. Even though he hadn't heard from them for days, he tried to stay positive, hoping they were all right. As time passed, his worries grew and wondered where they could be. On June 4, 1989, the Amber Waves, a sailboat returning to Tampa from Key West, spotted something troubling in the water. They saw what looked like a body of a woman floating face down. Her hands were tied behind her back, her feet bound, and a thin yellow rope was around her neck. She was unclothed from the waist down. Someone on the Amber Waves radioed the Coast Guard, and a rescue boat was sent from the Bayboro Harbor Station in St. Petersburg. The Coast Guard crew located the body and had difficulty retrieving it. There was something heavy attached to the rope around her neck, making it hard to bring her up. They noted the location and cut the line around her neck, placing her in a body bag before heading back to the station. However, before reaching the shore, they received another distressing message. Another female body had been spotted by two people on a sailboat. This time it was two miles off the pier in St. Petersburg. Like the first body, this one was also face down, bound with a rope around the neck, and naked from the waist down. The same Coast Guard crew went to recover it. As they were dealing with the second body, another call came in, a third female floating on a short distance away to the east. Once the third body was also recovered, all three bodies were brought to the Coast Guard station for examination and to be photographed by the arriving investigators from the Florida Marine Patrol. They were in a state of decomposition, making identification challenging. The women's hands and feet were tied in a similar manner and the second woman had managed to free one hand before dying. Duct tape covered their mouths, and the second and third bodies had concrete blocks tied to the ropes around their necks. It was believed that the first body also had a concrete block tied to its rope. Detectives suspected that the woman may have been assaulted and then thrown alive into the water with concrete blocks tied to their necks, causing them to drown. The discovery of the three murdered women shocked the community, leading to a massive investigation. Divers searched the waters for evidence, and police boats looked for more bodies in the bay. Autopsies were conducted to find out how they died and gather more clues. Since the bodies had no IDs, detectives tried to identify them through their clothing and jewelry. One of the women, the oldest, had long brown hair and was found in a black t-shirt with a gold wedding band on her left hand. Another had medium-length brown hair, wore a peach-colored shirt, and had three cloth bracelets with pink, green, and white stripes on her left wrist. The third woman, the youngest, had wavy brown hair and was dressed in a black tank top over a blue bikini top. She had four rings on her left hand, two gold and two silver, one on each finger. The struggle she put up allowed her to free one hand from the rope around her wrist. While Joe Rogers' husband, Hal, waited anxiously at the farm, he grew more worried as the days passed without any news from Joe and the girls. He called Joe's friends and relatives to check if they had heard from her, confirmed with her boss at the distribution center about her return date, and reported them missing to the authorities, but nobody had any information. Then, early one night that week, Jeff Beesby, Michelle's boyfriend, called Hal. He had received a postcard from Michelle with a picture of a girl in a bikini and a bull gator and the words, Fun Times in Florida, on the front. Hal asked Jeff to bring it to the house. As he read the postcard repeatedly, he couldn't find any clues about what might have happened. Feeling desperate and determined to do something, he went to his bank on Wednesday and withdrew some money. He had a plan in mind. Hal decided to conduct his own search from the air. He would find a private plane and a pilot, and together they would fly over the roads that Joe and the girls had taken from Ohio to Florida. On Thursday, June 8th, the maid at the Days Inn, Tampa, noticed something strange about room 251. The guests had checked in a week ago 
but the room seemed untouched since then. The beds were neat, the bathroom was unused, and personal items were left behind. The maid became suspicious and shared her concerns with the hotel's general manager. They decided to call the Tampa police to report the guest might be missing, especially given the recent news about the three bodies found in the bay. The Tampa police arrived and realized that the room could hold crucial information about the women's identities. They sealed off the room and called for support from detectives in both Tampa and St. Petersburg. The investigators carefully searched the room, taking photographs, collecting fingerprints, and examining all personal belongings. A technician matched the prints found in the room, including those on a tube of an Oral-B Sesame Street toothpaste, with the prints taken from the bodies in the bay. It was confirmed that the room belonged to the same three women. Meanwhile, the detectives started to make initial identifications using the information found in their purses and the registration from the front desk. Once they identified that the three women were Joe, Michelle, and Christy, they now called Hal in Ohio. On that same day, two significant events occurred in Tampa Bay. Firstly, the police started looking for the car the woman drove when coming to Florida. They were able to gather information about its make, model, and license plate from the motel registration form. Unfortunately, the car was not found in the Days Inn parking lot, so they expanded their search to the nearby areas and eventually located it at a boat ramp along the Courtney Campbell Parkway, just a few miles away. The car seemed untouched since Joe and the girls had left it there a week ago. It was locked and the passenger seat was pushed forward, as if someone had recently gotten out from the back seat. Inside the car, they found a Clearwater Beach brochure, a deck of Uno cards, and a puzzle book that someone had been working on in the back seat. On the front passenger seat, there was a piece of Days Inn stationery, with directions written by Joe herself, guiding them from the motel to a boat ramp. The direction said, Turn right, west on 60, two and a half miles on right side, alt before, bridge. Besides these words, there was one more instruction, blue with white. Now one thing seemed likely, the individual responsible for this crime probably owned a blue and white boat. The second major breakthrough, which was quite shocking, occurred when one of the investigators received a call from the chief of detectives at the Van Wert County Sheriff's Office. The detective wanted to ensure that the team investigating the homicides knew all the relevant facts about the Rogers family. He shared information about Michelle and her uncle, John Rogers, who was now in prison for assaulting a woman. He had also previously blindfolded Michelle and assaulted her. Although John was in prison at the time of the murders, the investigators couldn't overlook the striking similarities between what happened to Michelle on the farm and the events in Tampa Bay. In both cases, Michelle seemed to have been bound and assaulted. This raised the possibility that John might have orchestrated the murders from behind bars, possibly arranging for someone with a boat to take them out on the water. To get a clearer picture, they needed to learn more about the Rogers family. Understanding Joe, Michelle, and Christy better could lead them to discover how they ended up on the bay that night, alone with someone who intended to harm them. The very next day after identifying the bodies, two detectives flew to Ohio to delve deeper into the Rogers family. The detectives questioned Hal about his brother, John Rogers. Hal clearly stated that John was a loner, and at the time of the missing and eventual death of the Rogers women, he was in jail. There was no way he could plan a murder from inside the cell, as he had no connections with his prison mates. But during their inquiries, the detectives discovered unsettling information about Hal himself. They learned that Hal had posted John's bail when he was accused of assaulting a woman, and despite later learning about the allegations involving Michelle, he kept his word to support John. Hal explained that he wanted to keep peace within the family and believed that someone was lying. He had also said that he had already promised Joe that he would pay for his bail before he knew about the Michelle incident, and so he had kept his word. Another peculiar incident was a $7,000 cash withdrawal Hal made while the girls were missing. He explained that he needed the money to search for his family in Florida, as he didn't believe in credit cards. However, before he could carry out his plan, he learned of their deaths. After numerous interviews with Hal, the detectives found no concrete evidence implicating him in the murders. They observed his grief-stricken demeanor and accepted his explanation for the bond and the cash withdrawal. When the detectives asked him where the $7,000 went, Hal took them to the back of his truck. Inside it was a bag that had $6,000, and the rest was in Hal's pocket. After interviews in Ohio, detectives cleared Hal and John Rogers as suspects in the Florida murders. 
In October 1989, lead detective John Capel discovered a crucial lead while going through a bulletin from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. The bulletin mentioned an assault on a 24-year-old Canadian woman off Madeira Beach that occurred on May 15, 1989, just two weeks before the Rogers women were murdered. The description of the attacker's bow matched the one the Rogers women were last seen in. Capel and another detective flew to Canada to interview the victim and became convinced that the same man responsible for the assault was likely involved in the Rogers murder. The Canadian woman had met a man named David Posner at 7-Eleven in Madeira Beach. He was older, had tinted windows on his dark-colored four-wheel drive vehicle, and claimed to own an aluminum company and lived in Bradenton. He offered to take her on a boat ride the next afternoon. When she arrived, her friend decided not to go, so she went alone. After a seemingly pleasant trip, the man's demeanor changed, and he assaulted her. He threatened her, bound her with duct tape, and forced her to comply. When they returned to the shore, he even apologized for his actions. The woman was able to escape and provided the detectives with enough information to create a composite sketch of her attacker. Back in Florida, the detectives realized there was no individual named David Posner who matched the attacker's description. They decided to release the composite drawing and description of the man, his boat, and his vehicle to the public. This resulted in 400 tips pouring in, leading to a surge of activity in the investigation. However, despite their efforts, none of the leads seemed to pan out, and the case hit another dead end. As time passed, the number of detectives assigned to the case dwindled. Nearly six months after the murders, on December 23, 1989, the case seemed all but forgotten until Sergeant Glenn Moore took charge. Though lacking homicide experience, Moore refused to let the case fade away. He sought to reinvigorate the investigation, hoping to finally identify and apprehend the elusive suspect responsible for the heinous crimes. In October 1990, Joanne Steffi, a Tampa resident, saw a newspaper clipping of a composite drawing related to an assault case in Madeira Beach. She believed the sketch resembled one of her neighbors, a man who had recently moved in the area with his family. Despite feeling uneasy about him, Steffi hesitated to report her suspicions to the police, fearing involvement in the investigation. Later, during a chance encounter with the Hillsborough County Sheriff's deputy in her accounting class, Steffi confided in him about her neighbor's resemblance to the composite drawing. She asked the deputy to pass along the information without revealing her identity, hoping to remain uninvolved. Unfortunately, the tip somehow did not reach Sergeant Glenn Moore and his team, who were working on the Rogers murders case. They were overwhelmed with numerous tips and decided to utilize a new software called Holmes to organize their information better. They also sought assistance from the FBI's Behavioral Sciences Unit in Quantico. During this time, they interviewed Hal Rogers again and questioned around 70 people in Ohio to gain insights into the emotional states of Joe Rogers and her daughters. Meanwhile, a local newspaper, The Tribune, published an article pointing suspicions toward Hal Rogers, leading investigators to put Hal through a polygraph test to clear his name. After Hal passed the test, Sergeant Moore held a press conference to affirm that Hal was never a suspect, but a victim in the case. It was 1991, around a year and a half past since Joanne Steffi had shared her suspicions with the sheriff's deputy, but there had been no action taken yet. The man she found suspicious had already moved away with his family, having hardly interacted with others despite being amiable with people around him. The investigation into the Rogers murders continued, with Sergeant Moore sharing information received from Quantico during a press conference. Steffi's tip remained unaddressed as she wondered if the police were conducting background checks on the man she suspected. But again, gradually the case's progress was getting slower and slower. It was the spring of 1992. It had now been three years since the investigation started. The investigators had received 1,500 tips in this time, but still were nowhere close to identifying the assailant. However, they made progress in profiling the killer, concluding it was the work of a single man, based on the way the hands and legs were tied. They suspected that the person who gave directions to the Rogers family was the same individual who later lured them out. A distinctive handwriting on the directions prompted them to conduct a handwriting test. Sergeant Moore announced the new theory at a press conference, suggesting that the killers were likely charming, likable, and appeared respectable and harmless. Back in March 1992, Joanne Steffi's sister called the police to say that Steffi knew a man who resembled the suspect's sketches. The police tried to reach Steffi, but they couldn't get through. 
On May 14, 1992, it had almost been two and a half years since Steffi had tipped the police about her neighbor. Now Steffi saw the news in Sergeant Moore's press conference in the newspaper and wondered if she should report her suspicion again. Steffi recalled her former neighbor, who was an aluminum contractor and thought his handwriting might match the one in the composite sketch. She talked to Eileen Prisbiz, a civilian investigator about her neighbor, whose name was Oba Chandler in the contract, his boat, and his SUV. She found the contract in check from when Chandler built a porch for her neighbor, Moselle Smith. Steffi compared the handwriting from the contract and the press conference clipping, and she was convinced it was the same. Steffi called the task force again and told Prisbiz about the contract and handwriting. She wanted to provide a lead. They faxed the contract and check to the investigators, but the task force was dealing with a flood of tips, so it took time to look into Steffi's information among the other leads. Meanwhile, the investigators used billboards to seek public help in finding the killer. Joanne Steffi and Moselle Smith had already shared their suspicions, but there was a backlog of tips. Frustrated, they sent the handwriting samples again, which now caught the attention of the task force. Investigator Prisbiz reevaluated the writing, but couldn't make a definite match. The lead was handed to another investigator, J.J. Giegan, to follow up. On Friday, July 31st, Gio Giegan visited Moselle Smith in Tampa to obtain the original contract related to Oba Chandler. Upon comparing the contract's handwriting with the directions on the brochure, the task force found strong similarities, leading them to consider Oba Chandler as a new suspect. They quickly gathered more information about him, discovering he was a 45-year-old man living with his family in Port Orange near Daytona Beach. Oba Chandler became a significant suspect in the investigation of the Rogers women's murders. At the time of the murders, he lived on Dalton Avenue close to where Joe and the girls vanished, just two miles from the boat ramp. Records showed that he owned a 21-foot Bayliner boat with a blue and white interior and a dark blue Jeep Cherokee. He had an extensive criminal history, including charges of kidnapping, burglary, armed robbery, and counterfeiting. They compared a picture of Chandler with a composite sketch, and it was a perfect match. After three years of relentless investigation, Sergeant Moore was convinced they had their man. Another fact emerged. The man who had assaulted the Canadian woman before also owned an aluminum company, similar to Chandler's line of work as an aluminum contractor. To keep his real name hidden and avoid alerting Chandler, they referred to him as the Tin Man. The task force expanded rapidly, collaborating with the state attorney's office to build a strong case against Chandler. Starting from when 1969, when I was first arrested, you got to remember something where I was raised up as a kid. Uh, the majority of the time, he wasn't arrested. When you was caught doing something, you got the beat out of you with, with, with sticks, nightsticks by the cops. Chandler had a troubled past, with a history of crimes and a penchant for frightening and threatening people. Investigators spread across Florida and the Midwest collecting evidence against him. Born on October 11, 1946 in Cincinnati, Ober Jr. had a tumultuous childhood with his father taking his own life when he was young. He got into trouble early on, stealing cars and facing numerous arrests. As an adult, he faced a long list of charges, including possession of counterfeit money and armed robbery. Chandler married Deborah Ann Whiteman on May 14, 1988, just 10 days after she had divorced her previous husband. They bought a house on Dalton Avenue, close to Joanne Steffi, who later reported her suspicions about Chandler. Chandler's house had a canal leading to Tampa Bay, where he had a 21-foot Bayliner boat during the time of the Rogers murders. He sold the boat shortly after the crimes. He also owned a dark blue Jeep Cherokee during the same period, resembling the vehicle described by the Canadian tourist who was assaulted. Investigators had now gathered enough evidence to consider Oba Chandler as the prime suspect in the Rogers women's murders. In the summer of 1990, as news about the Rogers investigation and its upcoming feature on Unsolved Mysteries spread, Chandler, his wife, and young daughter Whitney left their home on Dalton Avenue. They stopped making mortgage payments, leading the bank to foreclose and sell the house. Chandler moved to Florida's East Coast in July 1990, initially living in Broward County before settling in Port Orange near Daytona Beach. Despite his credit issues by October 1991, he leased a house in his daughter's name. Chandler appeared normal to his neighbors, although they didn't know what he did for a living. Now in 1992, Investigators confirmed his handwriting and fingerprints matched evidence from the case, leading to surveillance of his new home with phone monitoring. 
In early September 1992, while other tasks were ongoing, two investigators, Detective Katie Connor Dubina and FDLE agent John Halliday, traveled to Toronto to speak with the Canadian tourist who had been assaulted at the Madeira Beach in May 1989, just two weeks before the murders. The woman, now 27 and married, worked as a social worker. They showed her six pictures of different men and asked her to identify the person involved in the incident. When she saw the third photo, she became visibly upset and confirmed that this was her assaulter. The photograph featured Oba Chandler. She signed the photo and asked to turn it over as it was disturbing her. A large team of about 40 to 50 law enforcement officers from various agencies including the St. Petersburg Police, FDLE, and the FBI were now surveilling Chandler around the clock. They had a command post near his house with a video camera monitoring his driveway. Whenever Chandler left, multiple unmarked cars followed him, carefully rotating to avoid being noticed. The FBI provided two small planes that took turns tracking Chandler from above, ensuring they never lost sight of him. They communicated with the ground units using the radio, saying, Eagle has the eyeball. After setting up surveillance, prosecutors arrived in Volusia County with an arrest warrant for Chandler on the charges of assault. Investigators planned to question him, showing photos of the victim to prompt him to talk to the FBI's Daytona Beach office. It was Thursday, September 17, 1992, the day that police had planned to question Chandler. That morning, just before Chandler was to be arrested, an unexpected event took place. As Chandler left his house in his blue Toyota Corolla, the surveillance teams debated whether to arrest him immediately or continue following him. They decided to keep trailing him, hoping he'd lead them to something significant. Chandler drove for a long time, and when he reached Lake City, the officers faced difficulties due to low fuel in the plane and a thunderstorm. They lost sight of Chandler in the heavy rain, and panic set in. They searched frantically but couldn't find him. Frustration and anger spread amongst the investigators, wondering if they missed their chance. They had to wait, monitoring Chandler's home, hoping he would return. Meanwhile, mysterious calls from Cincinnati and northern Kentucky added to the tension. The fear of Chandler potentially harming someone else haunted them. After losing Chandler for a week, the investigators received a call from Georgia, indicating he was returning. On September 24, 1992, they planned to arrest him without wasting any more time. Police waited for him on the I-95, but he took a different route. At a gas station in Port Orange, officers surrounded his car and arrested him for assault and battery. Back at the FBI office, they tried to make him talk, but he remained calm and asked for a lawyer. On the drive back to Pinellas County, Chandler talked casually with an FBI agent, even offering to provide information about a car scheme. The agent couldn't believe his audacity. Despite Chandler's complaints, his handcuffs remained secure. The next morning, Chandler had his initial hearing in a small courtroom at the Pinellas County Jail. The judge read the affidavit and kept bail at $1 million. Investigators found Chandler's blue and white Bayliner boat with a yellow Volvo engine. Inside his house in Port Orange, they discovered a mint green mesh shirt. The Canadian woman and her friend identified Chandler in a lineup. One of Chandler's many children, Crystal Mays, revealed that he visited her in 1989, admitting he was on the run for assault and possible killings. Her husband, Rick Mays, said Chandler confessed to assaulting women in his boat and throwing one overboard, mentioning he had murdered three women. With this new evidence, Chandler was indicted on three counts of first-degree murder in November, but the trial would not take place for another two years. It was the spring of 1994, several months before the trial was scheduled to begin. The prosecution now had access to Chandler's phone bills. While studying the bills, they noticed something strange. On May 15, 1989 and June 2, 1989, several collect calls were made to Chandler's house at specific times, 5.49 p.m. and 1.12 a.m., 1.30 a.m., 1.38 a.m., 8.11 a.m., and 9.52 a.m., respectively. All these calls were traced back to a special billing number, 813-223-0000, used for Marine phone calls. The prosecution wanted to know who made these calls. They discovered that the calls had to be made through a Marine phone operator, but unfortunately the records were destroyed. After persistent efforts, they found backup copies and were astonished to see that the May 15th call was made from a boat named Gypsy One, with the caller identifying himself as Oba. 
The June 2nd calls were also from Gypsy 1, with the fifth call identifying the person as Obi. On September 19, 1994, Chandler's trial began. During the trial, the prosecution acted swiftly, calling around 20 witnesses each day. They presented evidence like the directions found on the brochure in Joe Rogers' car, the palm print on the brochure, and Chandler's call from his boat. Chandler's daughter Crystal Mays testified about his shocking confession in Cincinnati, where he admitted to physical assault and possibly murder. In jail, too, witnesses had heard himself incriminate himself, talking about assaulting a foreign woman and mentioning the Rogers case. A laborer, Rollins Cooper, shared how Chandler spoke about a date with three women on the day of the disappearance. The Canadian tourist bravely testified about her terrifying encounter with Chandler. Hal Rogers, Michelle's husband, remained strong in court, thanking the brave Canadian woman. In a crowded courtroom, Chandler testified in his defense, appearing calm and composed. He confirmed meeting the Rogers family when they asked for directions to Days Inn in Tampa. He thought they meant a different one at first, but one of the girls clarified and directed them toward Rocky Point. Chandler explained that he was returning from a job estimate when he encountered them at a gas station near Interstate 4 in East Tampa. During his testimony, Oba Chandler denied any involvement in the murders and refuted allegations made by witnesses. He explained a fishing trip gone wrong on the night of June 1, 1989. After finishing fishing that night, Chandler encountered a problem with his boat. He attempted to start the engine, but it only sputtered briefly before stopping. Investigating further, he noticed a strong smell of gas and found that a fuel hose had burst, causing the entire 40-gallon tank to leak into the space beneath the boat's deck. Scott Hopkins, the investigator, noticed something odd in Chandler's testimony about the fuel leak in his boat. Knowing the boat well, Hopkins was certain Chandler was lying. He immediately informed the lead prosecutor during the lunch break, and a mechanic was set to reinvestigate Chandler's boat. After the lunch break, the prosecutor wasted no time in beginning the cross-examination. Chandler reluctantly admitted to his past felony convictions, and the prosecutor pushed him about the murder accusations made by his daughter and son-in-law, to which Chandler invoked the Fifth Amendment. The prosecutors then questioned the events of June 1, 1989, and exposed contradictions in Chandler's story about the fuel leak and his whereabouts. Evidence revealed that Chandler had made calls from the water before getting help, challenging his claims of being at a different location. The prosecutor also confronted Chandler about his escape to Cincinnati after the composite drawing of the Madeira Beach suspect was released. Chandler tried to downplay his fear, but the prosecutor implied they might have found their suspect. During a crucial moment, the prosecution team informed the lead prosecutor of a breakthrough regarding Chandler's boat. The mechanic had returned after checking the boat. Armed with this information, he cornered Chandler, asking about the broken fuel line. When asked about the fuel line's position, Chandler gave the wrong answer. When asked about the anti-siphon valve, Chandler could not give any answer. The prosecutor then told the court that the anti-siphon valve would automatically prevent a gas leak by closing the fuel line. Chandler was caught in his own web of lies. And after a day, it was time for the ruling. As the 12 jurors left the courtroom for deliberations, Chandler wore a faint smile on his face. The jury didn't take long to reach a unanimous verdict and as they returned and took their seats, his smile vanished, replaced by a look of anticipation. The verdict was passed on to Judge Schaefer, and then to the clerk to read it out. Imagine the fear. One victim was second, one watched. Imagine the horror. Finally, the last victim who had seen the other two disappear over the side was lifted up and thrown overboard. Imagine the terror. Oh, but Chandler, you have not only forfeited your right to live among us, under the laws of the state of Florida, you have forfeited your right to live at all. Chandler was found guilty of all charges, including first-degree murder. The court remained calm with no outburst or celebrations. The prosecutor showed little emotion, barely smiling. Chandler's fate had been sealed, and justice had been served. On September 29, 1994, Chandler was convicted on three counts of murder, and on November 4, 1994, Oba Chandler was sentenced to death. After the terrible murders, the family wanted to honor Joe and her daughters, Michelle and Christy. They took a family portrait, but since the girls were gone, they left three empty spaces. They put old photos of Joe and the girls in those spaces, creating a special picture. Joe's mom hung the portrait in the living room. It looks a bit strange, but it brings her comfort. 
Hal Rogers, Joe's husband, often looks at Joe's picture in a red dress. Even though he still feels sad, Hal believes that Joe and the girls watch over him, giving him strength. The portrait shows how much the family loved each other, and it reminds them that Joe and the girls are still with them in spirit. Whenever they see the picture, they feel the love that will never fade away, keeping Joe and her daughters forever in their hearts. On November 15, 2011, 22 years after the murders of the Rogers women, Oba Chandler took his last breath at 4.25 p.m., when he met his end through a lethal injection. When the bodies of the three women were discovered, their mouths were taped shut, but their eyes were left open. The killer's intention, according to the FBI profile, was to make them watch and experience fear. Hal Rogers, the father and husband they left behind, now sat across from the killer in the witness room. Separated by glass, he was witnessing Chandler's death. Chandler was strapped to a gurney with tubes in his arms as he faced his execution by lethal injection at the age of 65. When asked if he had anything to say, Chandler replied with a simple no, before closing his eyes for the very last time. However, an hour after his death, it was revealed that Chandler had actually left a final statement. On lined paper, he had written, You are killing an innocent man today. I, ca I can't hear anything but gunshots. She was shot in the chest and that the blood was coming from her chest, not going down into her chest. When I close my eyes, I can see Christy reaching her hand out to me while I'm driving and the blood just keep coming out of her mouth. And that, maybe it'll fade too with time, but I, I don't think so. That okay. haunts me the most. On the tranquil evening of May 19, 1983, a scene of unimaginable terror unfolded at Mackenzie Willamette Hospital in Springfield, Oregon. Diane Downs, a 27-year-old mother, arrived there with her three children, having endured the horrifying ordeal of a deadly carjacking. What is it? Somebody just shot my kids. There's blood. Come on. The children, bloodied and shot, were fighting for their lives, while their mother was shot in the arm. As news of this horrifying incident spread like wildfire, a nation stood united in shock and sympathy for the unfortunate family. Yet as the shadows lifted, an unsettling truth began to emerge. Who could have targeted the helpless children and their mother? What were the fragments of truth that held the power to reshape their entire story? Springfield, Oregon is a charming town tucked away in the breathtaking landscapes of the Pacific Northwest. Just a stone's throw from Eugene, Springfield has carved out its own identity. By becoming the beloved sister city that never quite outgrew its small town charm. And here's an exciting tidbit. Legend has it that Springfield served as the inspiration for the iconic American town featured in The Simpsons. As you wander through the streets, you'll encounter the coolest murals splashed across various walls. Despite this colorful backdrop, the crime in Springfield today surpasses the national average. However, back in the 80s, the occurrence of violent crimes in this region was unheard of. Therefore, when a mother of her three children were attacked in this very place, people were left stunned. It still stands as one of the most unsettling tales to have ever unfolded within the city's borders. At approximately 10.48 p.m. on Thursday, May 19, 1983, 27-year-old Diane Downs arrived at the Mackenzie Willamette Hospital ER. The mother pointed towards her red Nissan sports car and screamed out loud, Somebody shot my kids. What is it? Somebody just shot my kids. There's blood. There's blood. Come on. Eight-year-old Christine and three-year-old Danny were struggling to breathe as they lay in the back seat, gasping for air. Meanwhile, seven-year-old Cheryl was lying face down on the floorboard in front, nearly hidden beneath the dashboard, covered by a dark sweater. In a race against time, all three children were rushed to the emergency room. The mother, Diane, had a minor gunshot wound to her left forearm, which was wrapped in a towel. A surprisingly minor injury considering the viciousness of the attack. Her children, however, were in critical condition. They had been shot multiple times at close range. Dr. Stephen Wilhite, 
one of the few board-certified thoracic surgeons in the hospital that night, rushed to the hospital after hearing about the tragic incident. When I first walked into the, the ER, immediately they pointed me to Christy. When I looked at Christy, I thought she was dead. Her pupils were dilated. Um, her blood pressure was non-existent. And she is so close to death, it's unbelievable. Christy bore the brunt of three gunshot wounds, with two striking her left chest and one affecting her thumb. Due to immense blood loss, she had suffered a stroke. Danny had suffered a gunshot wound to his spine, resulting in paralysis. Although barely, both of them managed to hold on to life. Unfortunately, that was not the case for the other sibling, Cheryl, who had sustained two gunshot wounds to her back and was pronounced dead later that night. When news of Cheryl's death reached Diane, her demeanor was calm, a little too calm. She did not even flinch after hearing that the other two children had survived after being grievously injured. Her sole inquiry was whether the bullet had missed Danny's heart. The lack of visible emotional response from Diane struck those around her as odd, to say the least. I can only imagine the shock of everyone at the hospital. It was difficult for them to fathom how a mother who had just lost one child and found the other two in critical condition could appear so seemingly detached and unaffected. When I was finished taking care of Christy, then I sought out her mother, and to my complete surprise, Diane was non-emotional, not a tear in her eye. I've never seen a reaction like that at all. However, the medical professionals attending to her wound speculated that Diane might be experiencing shock, a common response to such a distressing incident. Understanding the gravity of the situation, the hospital didn't waste any time in alerting the authorities. Around 11.15 p.m., three officers from the Lane County Sheriff's Office Dick Tracy, Doug Welch, and Roy Pond arrived at the hospital. I got a phone call from dispatch, and I was told the mother and her children had been shot. When I got to the hospital, I was uh, directed to interview the mother. Once Diane's initial treatment was complete, she was seated for an interview with the detectives. They began the interview with an introduction and then moved on to ask Diane about the events that had transpired throughout the day seeking her first-hand account. This is Detective Tracy, uh, Wayne County Sheriff's Office, and uh, present in the room is Detective Welch, and did you say your name? Elizabeth Bell. When you got up and go ahead. From the beginning of the From day? From the beginning of the day. Oh, okay. I got up at 5.15, took a shower, fixed my face, got the kids up at a quarter to six, and they got ready and went to Grandma's house. Diane proceeded to tell the investigators that she left the kids at her parents' house at around 6.15 a.m. before heading off to work at approximately 6.30 a.m. Christy and Cheryl attended school while Diane's mother looked after Danny. After school ended, the girls joined their younger brother at their grandparents' home. Diane said she got off work at around 3.30 p.m. and went to her parents' house to pick up the kids. She returned to the rental duplex at 1352 Q Street with her children to have supper. But then there would be an unusual change in their otherwise ordinary routine. Diane had a friend named Heather Pollard, who resided outside of Springfield on Sunderman Road. She explained that Heather had previously expressed an interest in owning a horse to her. So when Diane had come across an article about horses available for adoption, she thought Heather might find it appealing. Since the Pollard family did not have a phone, Diane, accompanied by her children, decided to pay them a visit that night. They stayed at the Pollard property approximately 15 to 20 minutes, during which Diane engaged in conversation with Heather while her kids had the opportunity to feed and interact with the horse on the farm. We went out there. She already had a horse. She'd just gotten it a couple days earlier. Same day I found the newspaper article, as a matter of fact. And so we stayed and the kids fed the horse grass and pet the horse and stuff like that, and then we left. Diane said they left around 9.15 p.m. On their way back home, Cheryl occupied the front passenger seat, with Danny sitting directly behind her in the back seat, and Christy seated next to him, behind the passenger seat, instead of taking the direct route back home. 
impulsively Diane made a spur-of-the-moment decision to indulge in a bit of sightseeing, something she claimed both she and the children enjoyed doing. Like I said, we like to just cruise around and see stuff. We're new to the area and the kids love the scenery and the trees and they like to watch the rapids and the water with the river and stuff like that. We just liked enjoying stuff like that. However, after doing this for a while, she turned back toward Springfield, noticing all three children had fallen asleep. She was driving down Old Mohawk Road, outside the city, and Duran Duran's Hungry Like a Wolf was playing on the stereo. Like the Diane said she only drove for a short distance on that dark country road when she encountered a man in the middle of the road. So I just took off down there and got down a little ways and there was a guy standing in the road right waving his arm. He was not like on the white line, but he was in the center of my line. So I stopped and got out and asked him what was the problem. And because it looked, you know, it looked like he needed something. He was frantic. And so he came over to where I was and he said, I want your car. And I said, you got to be kidding. I mean, how many people really do that in real life? They don't. Diane proceeded to tell the detectives that the man pushed her toward the back of the vehicle and then put his hand into the open car window. The next thing she heard was the loud popping sounds which were directed towards Cheryl first, followed by Danny and finally Christy. He then turned to Diane and once again demanded the car. Diane further continued that she mustered up the courage to fight back, realizing that her children had been shot. I mean, I had to do something, so I begged her on the keys to distract him because I, he was a little bit bigger than me, not a whole lot, but a little bit. And I knew I could have beat him up in a fist fight and had a gun anyway, and I just... I figured if I could distract him, if I could just draw his attention away, I could shove him and get the hell out of there. Well, as he was swinging around, when, he, when I threw the keys, he swung around and he shot a couple times. And one of them caught me in the arm. And it didn't even hurt. It felt like somebody had squeezed me, and that's all. It didn't even hurt. But I knew I'd probably been hit. And I shoved him, and I jumped in the car, and we took off. I put the key in the ignition and took off. And if he fired after me, I have no idea because Chrissy was laying in the back seat just choking on her own blood. After Diane managed to escape in her car, she noticed that her children were bleeding profusely. While Christy was choking on her own blood, Danny was moaning in pain. But Cheryl didn't make any noise the whole time. Diane said she drove as fast as she could, but her own gunshot wound was causing her pain. So at some point she tightly wrapped a towel from her wrist to her elbow to slow the flow of blood. She says at that point she drove like a lunatic to the hospital. Just like the hospital workers, the detectives couldn't help but notice Diane's seemingly detached demeanor throughout the interview. Her demeanor was flat, not one tear, even though she knew that uh, uh, Cheryl had died. Despite the gravity of the situation and the tragic events that had unfolded, she didn't display the expected emotional response. Instead, she remained composed, not shedding a tear and even laughing at certain points. While it is true that shock and grief can manifest differently in individuals, the detective sensed that something wasn't adding up. Diane even went on to say that she prayed for their deaths to spare them from the suffering. I just kept saying, God, do it. There were more red flags. Who goes sightseeing in the dark with three young children in the car? Why would someone stop the car and interact with a suspicious individual on a deserted road? And which mother would prioritize tending to her own wound with a towel while her kids were bleeding to death? She had taken the time to carefully wrap her left arm in a towel while she drove to the hospital. Would you do that as a mother? I wouldn't put a towel on my arm. I'd put it on them as a tourniquet, rip it apart. The hospital workers also shared some of the disturbing comments made by Diane upon her arrival at the hospital. She reportedly made remarks such as, boy, this has really spoiled my vacation, and that really ruined my new car. I got blood all over the back of it. These comments were not only bizarre, but also deeply troubling, making everyone question the credibility of her story. And then she says, I really ruined my new car. I got blood all over the back of it. Despite this, the investigators wanted to give the benefit of the doubt to a grieving mother, so they did not yet rule out the possibility 
of an unknown perpetrator. Their attention shifted towards gathering more information about the perpetrator, whom Diane had described to them. He was medium build, but pushing towards being a little bit heavy. Um, he had darkish hair, but not black. It was like a brown, dark brown, whatever. His face was kind of stubbly. Um, not yeah. like a beard. Not like he had a beard, but like he hadn't shaved in a couple of days or something. Um, his, uh, his hair was kind of shaggy looking, like it had been cut in a shag, but not brushed out properly. It's just a voice, just a, no accents, no lisps, um, nothing that would distinguish him outwardly from anybody else. He was wearing a t-shirt that was a light color, but it wasn't pure white. The police swiftly issued an APB for the bushy-haired stranger, a term Diane had never used, but it summarized her description. Ironically, in law enforcement, the term bushy-haired stranger is used to refer to a person who does not exist and cannot be produced in a court of law. It serves as a cover-up alibi figure for the guilty party to falsely attribute their crimes to. Nonetheless, a composite sketch was made based on Diane's description and was widely circulated to the media. They came up with a composite, and that was circulated on every news station. So Elizabeth Down says a shaggy-haired stranger shot at her. Cops are racking their brains to try to put this case together. Unfortunately, no witnesses or individuals who had seen the alleged perpetrator or his vehicle came forward to provide significant leads or breakthroughs in the investigation. But as word went out about this horrific tragedy, Residents of Springfield were left in a state of shock and fear. The idea that a violent and ruthless individual had targeted innocent children and their mother left people on edge. Thursday night, a man flagged down a woman and her three children on the road from Marcola to Springfield. Friday, the manhunt began in earnest. Initially, there was panic. People in Oregon were like, oh my God. People were locking their doors and they were feeling very unsafe. Kids weren't allowed to go out by themselves. Mothers didn't go out in the evening and they sure didn't take their children. Children were no longer allowed to venture out alone. Mothers in particular refrained from going out in the evening with their children. The safety and security of the people of Springfield became a paramount concern. Amidst the chaos, authorities continued their investigation. A comprehensive search of the entire area was conducted which led to a significant discovery. Ejected casings from a spent 22 caliber firearm. The casings matched the bullet wounds inflicted on the members of the Downs family. The only evidence we had were some casings that uh, were found at the scene. We had divers in the river, but the gun was never found. Investigators at this point didn't have a lot to go on. Though they had their suspicions about Diane, they basically did not have any evidence to establish her guilt. That was when they came up with an idea. We asked Diane if she'd do a, a reenactment for us. We simply wanted to nail down her statements, and she was more than happy to do that. For the most part, reenactments are not easy for the victims, especially when they have experienced the loss of their loved ones. It is expected that most people would be overwhelmed with emotion and may cry while reenacting the most terrible moments of their lives. However, it was Diane Downs whose reenactment video would forever be remembered as one of the most disturbing ones in history. Sitting in the car is Elizabeth Diane Downs, one of the victims of this uh, murder attempt murder. I'm throwing the keys, okay? I'm throwing the keys. Simulating, yeah. Yeah, I go like that. I got in the car, knocked in, put the keys in. Dad just hit my cast. <laughs> Started the car and left. The car door shut itself. God. Alarmingly, not only was she seen giggling and joking, but she was even filmed fixing her makeup during the reenactment. It was enough to make the investigator's hair stand on end. Investigators knew that in order to understand this strange woman and piece together the case, they needed to delve deeper into her personal life. Elizabeth Diane Fredrickson, who went by her middle name, was born on August 7, 1955, in Phoenix, Arizona, to her parents, Wesley Lyndon Fredrickson and Willa Dean Fredrickson. Diane would grow up in what appeared to be the typical American family of the 1950s and 1960s, with her three younger brothers and one younger sister. Although Diane excelled at her studies, she was not at all popular in school. In fact, throughout her education, she was picked on by the other children. 
mostly because she came from a family with strict conservative values, and her parents forbade her to wear fashionable clothes or makeup. In her early years, Diane was a shy child, but that changed when she reached the age of 14, and she developed a tendency to talk compulsively. Diane graduated from Moon Valley High School in Phoenix, where she encountered her high school sweetheart, Stephen Downs, when she was just 15 years old. Despite her parents' disapproval, Diane continued the relationship with Steve, who was just seven months older than her. They stayed together for the remainder of high school, but their path diverged when Steve enlisted in the Navy in June 1972. After high school, Diane enrolled at Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College, located in Orange, California. However, her time at college was short-lived, as she was expelled after just one year due to alleged promiscuous behavior. Following her expulsion, Diane had no choice but to return to her parents' home in Arizona. Diane had a stifling atmosphere at home, as her parents constantly tried to clip her wings. Desperate to break free from the confines of her home life, she reconciled with Steve, eventually marrying him in November 1973. Diane was just 18 at the time. From the very beginning, their marriage was shaky at best. Additionally, the couple frequently fought over financial matters and accused each other of being unfaithful. Diane craved love and attention, only to discover Steve could not provide it. Diane found solace when she became pregnant, despite the ongoing problems in her marriage. Surprisingly, she didn't consult Stephen about getting pregnant. She just stopped using her birth control. I got pregnant when I wasn't allowed to, and I'm not saying he forbade me to get pregnant, but I, I didn't consult him. I wanted to have children, and so I got pregnant without asking permission. And she didn't regret the decision. Diane relished being pregnant, as it seemed to earn her the love and attention she had always desired. In October 1974, Diane gave birth to her first child, Christy. A pregnancy only lasted for a few months, and once it ended, Diane missed the attention she used to receive. So she once again stopped using birth control without informing her husband. As a result, Cheryl Lynn, their second child, was born in January 1976. But as much as she enjoyed being pregnant, she did not derive the same pleasure from actually raising her children. According to Steve Downs, Diane would frequently neglect her children. Well, once she had the kids, you know, it was another story, you know, well, uh, she treated them like crap, <laughs> you know, she didn't treat them, she really didn't treat them very good. Their fights would sometimes lead her to take the kids and run away from Steve, but she always returned eventually. After Cheryl's birth, Steve made the decision that he didn't want any more children. He couldn't trust his wife with birth control, so he opted for a vasectomy. However, despite this procedure, Diane ended up getting pregnant again, but she chose to terminate the pregnancy. In 1978, the couple relocated to Mesa, Arizona. It was there that Diane engaged in multiple affairs with her co-workers. One such affair with one of her male friends, Mark Sager, resulted in becoming pregnant once again. This time she decided to carry the child to term, and in December 1979, Stephen, Danny Daniel, was born. A final attempt to salvage their marriage, Stephen accepted Danny as his own, even though he knew he wasn't the father. Yet less than a year later, they got divorced. The children stayed with their mother. When the marriage ended, Diane didn't have a stable job. In her attempt to support herself, she pursued becoming a surrogate mother, but faced setbacks. She failed two psychiatric exams, one of which indicated that she was psychotic. Rather than being concerned, Diane found this amusing and would boast about it to her friends. In 1981, Diane finally secured a full-time job as a postal carrier in Chandler, Arizona. During her working hours, she would send her children to stay with various family members. However, concerns were raised by neighbors about the well-being of the children when they were in their mother's care. According to the neighbors, the children would often be hungry and would beg for food. In cold weather, they would not be adequately dressed in coats or suitable shoes. It was reported that if Diane couldn't find a babysitter, she would leave her six-year-old daughter, Christine, in charge of the other children. One neighbor even mentioned that Cheryl had expressed fear of her own mother. Despite the alleged negligence of her own children, later in the same year, Diane was finally accepted into a surrogate program. In May 1982, Diane gave birth to a girl named Jennifer, 
and surrendered her to her parents in exchange for $10,000. In February of 1983, just a few months before the shooting incident, Diane returned to Springfield, Oregon, to be closer to her parents. Despite the relocation, she maintained her employment as a postal worker. Despite Diane's unstable life, nobody could have anticipated the tragedy that would engulf her family just months later. As the investigation into Diane's past unfolded, she seemed to develop a newfound interest in giving interviews. It was evident that Diane enjoyed being in the spotlight and the attention that came with it. We were just out, I guess, sightseeing, I guess you'd say. And the kids got tired. They fell asleep in the car. So I decided to just head on home. But I saw a road I hadn't been on before. We liked to take back roads and just went down that road. And there was a guy standing in the road flagging me down. So I stopped. Within a few days of the tragic incident, she eagerly gave multiple interviews appearing with full hair and makeup. She would retell her story over and over, emphasizing her pain while frequently downplaying her children's fate. Danny's going to walk again. I don't care if we just have to will him to walk. I think he's going to walk. The doctors all say he won't. But I know that your mind controls your body, and if I can love him enough and encourage him enough, I believe he'll walk. She made this claim even after knowing that the bullet had caused significant damage to his spine and posed a risk of permanent paralysis. Diane may have intended to elicit sympathy from the public through these interviews, but it just had the opposite effect. Instead of garnering support, her behavior and demeanor during the interview began to raise suspicion and doubt among viewers. Everybody knew it, didn't ring true. Pretty much a lie. Everything she was saying was a lie. She could feel that the focus had changed from this bushy-haired stranger to her. People noted instances where she appeared to laugh or make light of the gruesome details of that fateful night. These actions, along with the inconsistencies in her narrative, caused public opinion to shift, viewing Diane less as a grieving mother and more as a potential perpetrator. As Diane noticed the shift in public perception, she attempted to counter the growing suspicion by posting contrasting questions. If I had shot my own children, would I not have done a good job of it? Why would I have taken my kids to the hospital? Wouldn't I have made sure they were dead and then cried crocodile tears? That's insane to think that I would do such a thing and then bring the, the witnesses in against myself. That's crazy. What Diane didn't know was that there was one person who had witnessed the truth she had so desperately tried to cover up. Joseph Inman was behind Diane's car that night and saw something that completely contradicted Diane's story. We found a witness, a gentleman, who came up behind her. Diane was traveling so slow that this witness's speedometer wouldn't move off the peg. It's uh, my belief that she was waiting for the kids to die. Diane's story didn't make sense from the start. After all, what would a stranger have to gain by shooting the children? If he had wanted the car, he could have just shot her, the only adult present at the scene and taken the car. Furthermore, the forensic evidence pointed towards a different scenario. Bloodstains were found on the side door of the front seat where Cheryl had been shot and on the rear seat where Danny and Christine had been hit, but there was no blood on the driver's side. If Diane had been shot as she described, it would be expected for her to instinctively grab the wound with her other hand, resulting in blood being present on her hand and the steering wheel. Additionally, the location of the gunpowder residue indicated that the shooter was likely seated in the driver's seat, casting further doubt on Diane's account. However, there was one interview that Diane Downs would give in November 1983 that would send shockwaves throughout the nation. People couldn't believe the level of narcissism displayed during the interview with reporter Ann Yeager for KEZI News. When this man shot my daughter, my first reaction was to snap back to my childhood, to the pain that had happened to me back then, my marriage, my entrapment by society. This man was bigger than me. He was stronger than me. He had more power because he had a gun. He was in control and I was not. And I had, there was nothing I could do. And I stood there and I looked at Christy reaching and the blood that just kept gushing out of her mouth. and and. What do you do? In a shocking audacity, she even stated that her kids were luckier than her and made jokes about it. 
Everybody says you sure were lucky. Well, I don't feel very lucky. I couldn't tie my damn shoes for about two months. Needless to say, it was a surreal experience for the viewers as they witnessed firsthand the depths of Diane's self-centeredness and lack of empathy. The lack of trust and suspicion surrounding Diane Downs went far beyond the media and law enforcement. Diane's own father casted doubts on her account and must have taken him an immense amount of courage to say this about his own daughter. But he too could not shake off the feeling that something didn't sit right. Diane had been shot in the left arm and she's right-handed. And I made the comment to the police department there that night. Uh, it looks to me like Diane did it because the children have been shot in the chest and Diane has only been shot in the arm. But the case against Diane Downs was still weak. All the evidence was circumstantial. The disturbing behavior exhibited by her and the inconsistencies in her story were not sufficient to directly establish her guilt in the crime. The case hinged on the other two witnesses, Christy and Danny. Unfortunately, Danny, being only three years old at the time of the attack, was too young to remember any significant information about the incident. This left Christy as the potential key witness. However, Christy's ability to communicate was severely impacted due to the stroke she suffered. Although there was hope, no one was sure if she would ever be able to speak normally. Yet every time her mother entered the room, Christy's eyes glazed over with apparent fear, and her heart rate significantly increased. In light of the overall circumstances and the need to ensure the safety and well-being of the children, the state made the decision to remove custody from Diane. It was determined that the children would be placed into foster care once they were released from the hospital. With each passing day, Diane became increasingly careless and overconfident in her demeanor. She even went as far as challenging the police to arrest her, as she firmly believed they did not have enough evidence to incriminate her. Please arrest me so that I can prove I'm innocent so my kids can come home and they wouldn't. At the same time, the police were still grappling with the lack of a clear motive for the murder. The strongest forensic evidence they had was the 22 bullet shells discovered at the crime scene, but the absence of a murder weapon hindered their progress. Faced with limited leads, detectives decided to visit Diane's apartment in the hopes of finding any additional clues. We went to Downs' apartment and conducted a search at the residence. The first notable piece of evidence that the detectives found at Diane's home was a diary. It served as a treasure trove of information about Diane's life after she had moved to Chandler in 1982. While working as a postal carrier, Diane involved herself in multiple affairs with married co-workers. One of them, however, would alter the course of her life permanently. In July 1982, Diane Downs began an affair with Robert Knickerbocker, a fellow co-worker who was married to a woman named Charlene. At the time, he was having problems with Charlene and was looking for a distraction. Diane never meant anything more than a fling to him, and he had no intention of leaving his wife. However, to Diane, he was her greatest love. In her diary, Diane mentioned how she never loved anybody more than she loved Nick, her affectionate nickname for him. She fantasized about building a life and starting a family with him. She was so interested in him that she rented an apartment and even got a tattoo of a large rose with his name beneath it. That was not the case with Nick. Throughout the nine months of their affair, Nick's commitment wavered between Diane and his wife Charlene. In February of 1983, Diane's pursuit of Nick reached a breaking point. She began pressuring him to divorce his wife, and he finally confessed that he loved his wife, Charlene, more than he loved Diane. He also made it clear that he had no desire to have children, and he didn't intend to become the stepfather to her children either. In an attempt to manipulate the situation, Diane requested a transfer from Chandler to Springfield, Oregon, where her parents lived. She believed that this move would intimidate Nick and make him run back to her. She even asked her father, Wes, who also worked for the Postal Service to help Nick find a job in Oregon. However, once Diane left Arizona, Nick gained clarity and realized that he didn't want to move to Springfield or be with Diane. He decided to stay with his wife and refused Diane's mail and calls, marking the definitive end of the relationship. Despite the end of the relationship in April of 1983, Diane's infatuation with Nick continued to consume her thoughts and writings. She expressed her longings for him, both physically and emotionally. 
even after everything she held on to the hope that he would eventually come back to her. Surprisingly or not surprisingly, her lingering feelings for Nick did not stop her from sleeping with other men, beginning just seven days after her arrival in Springfield. When the police searched her home, they found that Diane had kept two of Nick's pictures with her own pictures on top of the television, but there were no pictures of the kids. The detectives made an observation that Diane seldom wrote about her children, Christy, Cheryl, and Danny, in her diary. The majority of her diary entries revolved around Nick. However, on May 11, 1983, just eight days before the shootings, Diane's focus abruptly shifted. It was as if she had suddenly rediscovered her children and started describing them as fantastic, smart, and sweet. She portrayed her family as a tight-knit group, referring to themselves as the Four Musketeers, and expressing a newfound love for them that supposedly surpassed her feelings for Nick. Investigators believed that at this point Diane had already made plans to kill him. It was not just another red flag. The detectives believed they had finally found the motive for the crime. According to them, Diane saw her children as thorns in her side. He wasn't going to join her as long as she had the kids. The quickest, simplest way was to eliminate the children. She believed that removing her children from the picture would make her become more appealing to Nick, and that he would then be willing to provide emotional support and comfort in the aftermath of the tragic event. It wasn't the only incriminating evidence police found at Diane's home. They also found a few unfired 22 caliber shell casings with extractor markings. When detectives asked Diane if she owned any 22 caliber firearms, she denied this vehemently. But both Steve Downs and Robert Knickerbocker confirmed that she did in fact own one such firearm. The detectives approached Nick and requested his assistance in obtaining a confession from Diane. By exploiting her weakness towards him, he agreed to cooperate and made a few calls to Diane. Listen, uh, what have you told the police about me? Nothing. Well, uh, you must have told them something, because, uh, I got to have an alibi for that night. No, you don't. Yeah, I do. They already told me. They're bluffing. They're trying to pin this on me, and I didn't do it. During the call, Diane primarily focused on her own experiences and emotions, particularly her physical pain and the need for emotional support. How's everything? Nothing changed. That's good. Things have changed a lot for me. Yeah, I can imagine so. I have a steel plate in my arm. I'm glad you called. I need somebody to talk to. I was thinking about you real bad last night. Just need somebody to talk to again. Yet she failed to express concern about the well-being of her surviving children. In one call, Nick told Diane that he didn't believe her story. Whether Robert Knickerbocker was worth murder to Diane Downs or not, she did not confess to the crime. At this point, detectives were no longer playing on the surface. They confronted her directly and made it clear that she was the primary focus of their investigation. It was the time that we decided to take her on and seriously challenge her on the inconsistencies in her story. Detectives are no longer being Mr. Nice Guy. They're playing hardball. Diane, your story stinks. This whole thing is... It stunk from the beginning. I'm fine. Realizing that sarcasm wouldn't save her, Diane changed her story. She claimed that there was no bushy-haired stranger, but instead it was two men wearing ski masks who attacked her and her children. According to Diane, the men knew her as they called her by name. Talked to you, yeah. referred to you by name, yeah. and also referred to your tattoo. Right. As close as you can remember, what did he tell you? If you say anything about what happened here, did they come back and kill me? Throughout a two-hour period, the detectives relentlessly probed her for the truth, and as they neared the conclusion, her frustration reached a boiling point. I'll make you a deal, okay? Next time I remember something, yeah, you can find the guy yourself, because I know I didn't do it. And you can chase your little tail for the next 20,000 years if that's what it takes. You don't like my help, you can get You're real confident in this stuff, aren't you? I know that I didn't do it. Come on, Diane. It's your turn at that. 
Since you guys seem to think that I should have brought Diane with me, I will get it myself. Because I know who did it. You do know who did yes, it? Yes, I do. I damn sure do. You know him by yes, name? I do. Yes, I do. Yes. You saw him shoot your kid? Yep. Pretty important. And I saw him grab my arm and yank my arm out and shoot my arm and say, now try to get away with it. The tape ended with Diane storming out of the sheriff's office, unable to put up with the questions. And I'm leaving because I know who did it. Bye. The time is now 1746, and Diane is just departed the office. We're concluding the tape. A month passed after the shooting, the pressure was mounting on law enforcement to make an arrest. By the beginning of 1984, police had gathered all the evidence pointing towards the prime suspect, Diane. However, they eagerly awaited Christie's recovery as she was the only person who could provide them with a first-hand account of what truly transpired. Christy would be a key witness uh, in this trial, but she needed to be healthy enough uh, physically and emotionally to be able to take the stand. Christy's healing process was slow but steady, and she eventually regained her ability to speak, despite her initial fear, with the help of therapists working tirelessly with her for months. Christy mustered the courage to eventually reveal the truth. It was a truth that would put an end to all the speculations surrounding the case. Confirming what many had already suspected, Christy unequivocally declared that her own mother, Diane Downs, was the one who shot her and her siblings on that fateful night. On February 28, 1984, nearly nine months after the shooting, Diane was finally arrested. She's been charged with uh, one count of murder, two counts of attempted murder, and two counts of assault in the first degree. Diane pleaded not guilty to all charges, and thus the case proceeded to trial. However, Diane Downs was not one to go down so easily. When her trial commenced in June 1984, she shocked the nation by appearing visibly pregnant, leaving everyone speechless. As it turned out back in October of 1983, while working as a postal carrier, Diane seduced a young teacher and ended up becoming pregnant. Diane said she felt lonely without her children. I got pregnant because I miss Christy and I miss Danny and I miss Cheryl so much. I'm never going to see Cheryl on earth again. And I just, you can't replace children, but you can replace the effect that they give you. And they give me love, they give me satisfaction, they give me stability. They give me a reason to live and a reason to be happy. And, and that's gone. They took it from me. But children are so easy to conceive. The prosecution, however, saw it as Diane's way of gaining sympathy. The trial of Diane Downs became a national spectacle, with hundreds of people lining up each day in hopes of securing a seat in the courtroom. Though cameras were not allowed inside the courtroom, the media closely followed the trial. The jury was comprised of nine women and three men. The trial lasted a month. The prosecutor, Fred Hughie, had a solid case against Diane. The evidence against Diane appeared insurmountable. Along with the bullet casings and blood spatter, Hughie called upon a number of witnesses, including Heather Plord, Joseph Inman, Stephen Downs, and Robert Knickerbocker. They all testified against Diane. Defense attorney Jim Jagger, made every effort to present Diane Downs' version of events, emphasizing the involvement of a bushy-haired stranger. Diane herself took the stand and reiterated her story, staunchly maintaining her innocence. However, she struggled to provide a convincing explanation for the inconsistencies in her account. Diane also testified that she had been physically abused by her father on multiple occasions, which impacted her future decisions a disturbing claim that Diane's family denied. The jury viewed this claim as a lie intended to invoke sympathy, and Diane's family denied the allegations as well. The most anticipated witness of this trial was Christine Downs. With utmost bravery, then nine-year-old Christy, still suffering with a speech impediment, took the stand to recount the night of May 19, 1983. Who shot you? My mom. Christie's recollection of the events on May 19, 1983, was vivid and haunting. She remembered the moments leading up to the shooting, including visiting Heather Ploward. Christie and Danny occupied the back seat, 
while Cheryl sat in the front passenger seat. Christy recalled that after a few moments into the ride, the car was pulled over to the side of the road, and her mother, Diane, exited the vehicle. She saw her mother going to the back of the car and retrieved something from the trunk. Diane then returned to the car, leaned across the front seat, and shot Cheryl, who was in the front passenger seat. Afterward, Diane leaned over the back seat and shot Danny. Christy also remembered that she was also shot by her mother, as she witnessed in horror. She began sobbing, describing the gruesome details of that night. In a heartbreaking response to Hughie's final question about her feelings for her mother, Christy expressed that she still loved her. Her testimony sealed her mother's fate. On June 17, 1984, Diane Downs was found guilty on all counts by the jury. Her sentencing was scheduled for the following month. However, just ten days after the verdict, Diane gave birth to her third daughter, whom she named Amy Elizabeth. The child was immediately taken into custody by the state of Oregon, establishing that Diane could not have been more wrong in her prediction. We're going to take away this one. I don't know how they're going to do it. <laughs> what if the, I, I'd like to see them try to take this baby from me. And <laughs> how? The girl was later adopted by Chris and Jackie Babcock, who chose to rename her Rebecca Babcock. On August 28, 1984, Judge Gregory Foote sentenced Diane Downs to life imprisonment, plus an additional 50 years to be served consecutively. After their mother's conviction, Christy and Danny remained in the care of their foster family for a brief period, before Fred Hughie, the prosecutor in their mother's case, and his wife, Joanne, stepped forward to adopt them. Recognizing his own limitations and the challenges posed by raising two children with physical and emotional trauma, Steve Downs made the difficult decision to step aside as their father. The saga of Diane Downs was expected to be confined within the walls of the prison, but she was determined not to serve her time quietly. Diane continued to give interviews to whomever wanted to talk to her, while still stressing her innocence. I can sit here with a clear conscience and know that I did not shoot my kids. On July 11, 1987, a highly unexpected event unfolded when Diane Downs managed to escape from the Oregon Women's Correctional Center in Salem. I recognize it to be a shirt belonging to Diane Downs. Convicted murderer Diane Downs left behind her ripped blouse, evidence of her struggle to break out of the maximum security facility. She accomplished this daring feat by scaling an 18-foot razor wire fence, cleverly disguising herself with multiple layers of clothing. Uh, at that location, the perimeter fence is not alarmed. Uh, is alarmed, but the interior fence is not. I would not consider it a, an effective deterrent. Um, and that's essentially how she got out. She went up and over the single perimeter fence. This triggered one of the most extensive manhunts ever conducted in the state of Oregon. Downs was dropped off at this family restaurant about one mile from the correctional facility. Police believe she then traveled on foot into town. Reports of dying sightings flooded in from all over Oregon and the Northwest as the public remained vigilant. It would take 10 days before she was eventually located, during which time she could have potentially fled across the country to any unknown destination. Astonishingly, she had been hiding less than a half a mile away from the prison, living with another married man, the husband of a fellow inmate. Ironically, Diane would later claim she escaped to find the bushy-haired stranger. I wanted revenge at that time. I, I wanted to do some really obscene things to his body. Diane received an additional five-year sentence for the escape. Best-selling crime author Anne Rule penned the book Small Sacrifices in 1987, providing a detailed account of Diane Downs' life and her murder trial. The book gained significant attention and interest from readers. In 1989, a made-for-TV movie, also titled Small Sacrifices, was produced based on Anne Rule's book. The movie starred Farrah Fawcett, who portrayed Diane Downs, and it was broadcasted on ABC, further capturing public interest in the case. He shot my kids. He shot them over and over. And I keep hearing the gun. Then he shot me. In 1998, Anne Rule and Diane Downs made an appearance on The Oprah Winfrey Show, during which Diane directed criticism and taunts towards Anne for how she portrayed her life in the book. The Diane Downs story. Have you read that book? Uh, yes, I have. And what do you I think? I take issue. I take issue with much of it. Okay, okay. What do you take issue with? 
Well, she considers it a true story, and she's quoted me all through the book and tells the reader how I'm feeling, what I'm thinking at various times all through the book, yet she's never interviewed me. How does she do that? How does she justify that being a true story? In 1989, Diane wrote a book titled Best Kept Secrets, in which she provided her own account of the shooting. In classic Diane Downs fashion, she portrayed herself as a victim of the state of Oregon. In the mid-2000s, Rebecca Babcock, the youngest daughter of Diane Downs, reached out to her birth mother. Throughout most of her life, Rebecca had kept her distance from the tragic reality of her birth. However, in 2005, after placing her own baby up for adoption, she started to empathize with her mother. Rebecca wondered if Diane had also experienced a similar sense of emptiness when she gave her away. I thought about, you know, Diane, and, and that was the one and only time I have ever had compassion for that woman. With uncertainty in her heart, Rebecca wrote a letter to Diane and attached a few pictures of herself. I don't know if you're going to believe me. You probably won't. But I believe that I may possibly be your biological daughter. Diane immediately wrote back. You look like me. Same chin. Don't you hate it? However, with each subsequent letter, the content became increasingly unsettling. So much so that Rebecca requested Diane to stop writing back, as she now saw her as a monster. The feelings were mutual as it seemed. Diane went on to deny that Rebecca was even her daughter. What was I thinking? Why in the world did I contact this woman? Diane Downs made three attempts for parole. The first was in 2008, followed by another in 2010, and the most recent one in 2020. However, she was denied parole on all occasions. The parole board cited her failure to admit guilt and the lack of perceived remorse as factors contributing to the denials. All I know is that I did not murder my children, and one year after my uncle was murdered, my children and I were attacked for no reason at all. That you did not commit these murders? Or the, the murder and the other crimes you were convicted of? Absolutely. I didn't commit them, and I still maintain my innocence. Despite a horrid start in life, both Christy and Danny had moved on in their lives. With the Hugies, they found the nurturing and supportive environment they had never experienced with Diane. The shooting incident caused Christy to have a lifelong speech impediment, while Danny continues to live with partial paralysis due to the bullet in his back. But these challenges did not stop them from living life to the fullest. Both Christy and Danny pursued higher education and successfully graduated college. Christy eventually got married and became a mother to a baby boy and a baby girl whom she named Cheryl, in honor of her late sister. On the other hand, Danny has excelled in the field of computers and works in the computer industry. They prefer to maintain a private life and have chosen to sever all contact with Diane or anyone related to her. As we come to the conclusion of this mind-boggling story, the events of that fateful night still leave us pondering what truly unfolded. Do you find Diane's story credible? Or do you think that it is nothing but a bunch of lies? Let us know your opinion. We'd love to hear from you. If you would like us to cover a case, please drop your recommendation in the comment section. Like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more gripping true stories like this. She was not herself. She was so confused that she looked into the camera with this intense look on her face, like, what do you want from me? There was nothing in her eyes. There was no personality there. It was like a zombie. Let us travel back to October 22, 1984, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where the city was left in disbelief as 18-year-old Annette Craver vanished without a trace. The police determined to unravel the truth, scoured the area, but their efforts were in vain and the whereabouts of the teenage married girl remained a haunting mystery. While the mystery of her disappearance loomed large, the police suspected that it wasn't just a simple disappearing act, but a terrifying case of homicide. This situation was considerably more twisted than initially apparent. A man was at the center of it all, and his twisted mindset would triumph over the quest for justice for an incredible 54 years, until justice finally succeeded. What could have happened to young Annette? Who was this psychopath? And why did it take so long to unravel the truth behind this haunting case? As we delve into this chilling case, 
We will also lead you through two other haunting mysteries intricately connected to this story. Tulsa, Oklahoma is a captivating city with a unique blend of modernity and tradition. Nestled in the heart of the United States, this metropolis offers a dynamic lifestyle enriched by its diverse cultural scene. Tulsa is renowned for its well-preserved Art Deco architecture, thriving performing art scene, and mouth-watering Oklahoma-style barbecue joints. Additionally, the city holds fame for a significant history in oil production and proudly stands as the birthplace for the iconic Route 66. Despite its successes, Tulsa has had its struggles with crime. In 2020, the city's violent crime rate surpassed the national average, elevating it to one of the cities with some of the highest crime rates in the U.S. Adding to the city's darker side, Annette Craver's mysterious disappearance also occurred within Tulsa. Born on December 7, 1965, in Houston, Texas, Annette Michelle Craver's early years remained relatively shrouded in mystery. However, a significant turning point occurred when her father tragically lost his life in a car crash in 1979. The heartbreaking event took a toll on Annette's emotional well-being. Her mother, Mary Rose, observed a notable change in Annette's behavior, noting that she grew increasingly withdrawn and often sought solace in solitude. She spent a lot of time alone. She was always writing poetry and drawing, picked up the guitar. Deep within her heart, Mary held the understanding that her cherished daughter had been grappling with immense difficulties following the loss of her father. Annette, I'm sure, missed her dad more than I realized. I even asked her one time if she thought she needed to see someone to talk, and she said, no, Mom, I'm fine. On September 8, 1981, a significant event occurred as Mary orchestrated a yard sale in Houston to part with her late husband's belongings. Annette, then 15 years old, actively assisted her mother in the sale. Despite her silence regarding her feelings, it was evident that Annette was far from having moved past the profound loss of her father. Kind of solitude and isolation concerned Mary. But Mary didn't realize that Annette wasn't actually feeling lonely. Unbeknownst to Mary, Annette had been involved with a man whose charm was coupled with a significant age gap. He was not only older than Annette, but even surpassed her mother's age. It was during the yard sale that Mary had her first encounter with Annette's friend, 40-year-old Felix Vale. As he approached Annette to engage in conversation, observing the notable age difference, Mary remained unsuspecting, never entertaining the notion that something more was going on. I may have seen him on his motorcycle. He was just another customer. In the aftermath of Annette's father's demise, Mary grappled with the weight of financial hardships. The task of securing employment in Houston proved elusive, prompting her to consider relocating in pursuit of better opportunities to provide for her daughter. Following a series of challenges, Mary's determination bore fruit as she secured a job offer in the state of Oklahoma. However, a significant concern remained. Annette, who had already missed two years of school, was on the verge of graduating high school. Mary understood that relocating abruptly to a different state could jeopardize her daughter's academic process. Faced with this dilemma, Mary opted for a solution. She reached out to a friend seeking assistance in caring for Annette while she made the move to Oklahoma to secure employment. While the plan initially appeared sound, it soon began to unravel for Mary. As time passed, a growing concern emerged. Annette and Felix's relationship seemed to have intensified in her absence. Mary couldn't shake off her unease as she observed the 40-year-old man becoming increasingly intertwined in her underage daughter's life, a situation that deeply troubled her. She did mention in letters that Felix stopped by, but I didn't know that there was intimacy. And then I learned that Felix made many, many visits. I regret that I left, and she even said to me in a letter, I feel like you abandoned me. After Annette's high school graduation, Mary's diligent savings allowed her to purchase a new house. With the dream of living together once again, she registered the house under both their names. However, upon her return to Houston, Mary discovered that Annette had already left, dashing her hopes of a long-awaited reunion. My gosh, why didn't I do this differently? All the decisions I made that I would do differently now. Mary learned that when Annette graduated, Felix swiftly proposed a road trip to her, and captivated by his charm, she readily agreed to his proposal. Over time, in 1983, Mary did receive sporadic letters from Annette, each from a different location. Then, one day a call arrived from her daughter, who was then in California. 
Mary felt a surge of joy hearing from Annette, but the conversation soon took a stressful turn. Annette, who was just 17 back then, sought her mother's approval to marry Felix Vale. said, why don't you wait till you turn 18? This is a big mistake. She said, I love you, Mom, and we'll go to Mexico and get married. Knowing that there was a chance of losing her daughter, who was deeply involved with Felix, Mary struggled with the difficult choice that lay ahead. It was clear that saying no would come with its own consequences, yet arriving at a choice was far from straightforward. I trusted her, and I didn't know he was a bad guy, so I feel for it. With a heavy heart, Mary ultimately made the difficult choice to allow Annette to marry Felix. However, the idyllic married life that Annette had envisioned would soon begin to crumble. Shortly after their marriage, Annette confided in her mother through heartfelt letters. She revealed that Felix had undergone a troubling transformation, turning increasingly controlling. Shockingly, she shared that Felix had even coerced her into undergoing an illegal abortion, following her pregnancy with his child. Consumed by fear for her daughter's well-being, Mary implored Annette to return home without delay. Eventually, in 1984, Annette found the courage to break free from Felix's hold and found her way back to her mother. However, upon laying eyes on her daughter, Mary couldn't help but recognize that her beloved daughter had changed. She was not herself. She was so confused when we were painting the downstairs and she looked into the camera with this intense look on her face like, what do you want from me? I think she was just overwhelmed with the way he had tried to control her and mess with her mind. Amidst the changes, Mary felt comforted by reuniting with her daughter. However, this joy didn't last long. Soon after Annette came back, their happiness was disrupted. Felix's constant phone calls started tormenting their home, with him insisting on speaking to Annette. Undeterred, Mary stood her ground, determined to shield her daughter at any cost. However, in October 1984, the situation escalated when Felix managed to breach the boundaries of Mary's home one day, boldly entering without consent and approaching Annette directly. The two spent a period in Annette's room and discussed matters privately, and when they finally emerged to face Mary, they would say something that would devastate her. Then they approached me and said, we want you out of the house. Despite the heartbreak, Mary made attempts to mend the situation with Annette, but her efforts were in vain. Annette remained firmly under Felix's influence, impervious to any other perspective. Thus, with a heavy heart, Mary relinquished her share of the house, gathered her belongings, and moved to California. However, that was not the end of the nightmare. As Annette reached the age of 18, she took a significant step by accessing the inheritance left by her deceased father. Shockingly, she allegedly transferred all the funds into Felix's account and also transferred ownership of her house to his name. Upon learning of this alarming development, Mary wasted no time and immediately contacted Felix. What he told me was that he put her on a bus and that she was going to Mexico. I hung up and called the police and filed a missing persons report. On October 22, 1984, upon receiving the missing person report, the Tulsa police swiftly approached Felix Vale in an attempt to obtain any possible information. Regrettably, much like Annette, the police too fell victim to Felix's manipulation. Mary strongly suspected that Felix played a crucial part in Annette's disappearance and was hiding the truth. However, despite her convictions, the police were swayed by Felix's words, leading them to abandon the search for Annette Craver Vale. They believed Felix. He convinced them that she had left on her own. Better I wrote to the DA. They didn't respond, so... Left with no options, the mother found herself in a state of helplessness, clinging to a resolute belief that her daughter would one day return. I wanted to believe she was alive. I waited and waited. I sat by the phone, and I kept waiting for a call. Christmas, her birthday, my birthday, Mother's Day. I would stay close to a phone on those days in those early years, thinking this is it. This is the day she's going to say, hi, Mom. By 1991, a staggering seven years had elapsed with no breakthrough in locating Annette. Mary tried to reach out to the police by sending them hundreds of letters, but neither the police nor the FBI was interested in responding to her. Even the letters she sent to Felix were left unanswered. Mary came to the stark realization that relying on others would yield no results. Driven by her determination, she resolved to undertake an investigation on her own. 
Convinced that Felix held a key to Annette's disappearance, Mary initially attempted to gather information about him through the fledgling resources of the Internet. Yet during the 1990s, online information was far from abundant. Through her unwavering research, Mary managed to secure a solitary but significant lead, Felix's sister, Sue Jordan. Fueled by hope and the prospect of uncovering crucial information, Mary embarked on a journey that spanned halfway across the country to meet with her. She told me that Felix had a wife who had drowned. Armed with this startling revelation, Mary swiftly managed to trace the family of Felix's first wife, Mary Horton Vale, in Louisiana during 1993. Her efforts bore fruit as she successfully located Mary Horton's brother, Will Horton, who had been merely 15 years old at the time of his sister's tragic drowning in the Calcasieu River. A lady calls me and says, you don't know me, but Felix Vale married my daughter and she's missing. And I said, oh my God. During Mary's meeting with Will, he fondly recalled his sister as a kind and virtuous individual, speaking of her in glowing terms. His sister was so very special, so thoughtful, kind. However, the sentiment wasn't reciprocated when it came to his brother-in-law, Felix Vale. Will shared that the Horton family held a distinct resentment towards Felix. Born on February 16, 1940, in Eunice, Louisiana, Mary Elizabeth Horton Vale's roots trace back to the southern state. In 1957, she was crowned a Eunice High School homecoming queen and took on the role of the editor for the school newspaper. Her path crossed with Felix's when she was pursuing her education at McNeese State College in 1960. Remarkably, a mere six months after their initial meeting in July 1961, the two exchanged vows in marriage. Their union bore fruit, as in 1961, Mary welcomed a son into the world named Bill Vale. However, Felix had a different opinion. My sister radiated over that baby. This was part of the dream. You go to school, you go to college, and you have a family. With the arrival of their baby, Felix's demeanor underwent a notable change. Similar to his later behavior with Annette, he adopted a controlling attitude towards his first wife. He even used threats, warning her of severe outcomes if she were to become pregnant again. Despite the warning, Mary Elizabeth Horton Vale found herself pregnant again the following year. The news incited a fierce anger within Felix, prompting her to seek refuge from his rage. Fearing his wrath, she retreated to her mother's home, accompanied by her son, Bill. She had thoughts of leaving Felix. And that's why she was there, talking to my mom. My mom suggested that she go back and try to work things out, and then they would have another conversation. But she died before there was another conversation. October 28, 1962, marked a tragic event when Mary Horton and Felix Vale were engaged in fishing along the Calcasieu River. In an unfortunate twist of fate, Mary met her demise by drowning. When questioned by the police, Felix recounted his version of events. We took the boat from the Calcasieu River, near Lake Charles, he stated. While Mary was trawling, she shifted her position in the boat and accidentally fell overboard. However, the Horton family remained skeptical of this account, finding it hard to accept as the truth. What's it like when you met with Will Horton? Did he think that his brother-in-law had killed his sister? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And so did his parents. And they felt helpless. Felix swiftly became the prime suspect in the case due to suspicious circumstances surrounding Mary's drowning. The location of her death was not suitable for fishing activities. Her body, discovered two days later, underwent an autopsy that revealed telltale signs Bruising on her neck, right calf and left leg indicated a possible struggle prior to her immersion in water. Further incriminating evidence emerged as authorities found a scarf wrapped around her neck and placed in her mouth, suggestive of traumatic asphyxia, a form of suffocation. Despite mounting evidence and all the detectives being sure that Felix was the murderer, the coroner had a totally different opinion. He believed that evidence was not enough to convict Felix. Moreover, Felix vehemently denied any guilt. In January 1963, a Calcasieu Parish grand jury failed to indict him, resulting in his release. He was absolutely a suspect in her death. But he was released three days later. Why? The coroner, at the time, ruled that the death was an accidental drowning. As a prosecutor, how do I prosecute a murder case when the coroner says it's not a murder? So they really had to let him go. As Will conveyed this information, breaking down in the process, Mary Rose was further inflamed by what she heard. 
destroyed my mother. It left a hole in me I have still today. Now, Mary Rose's pursuit extended beyond seeking justice solely for her daughter, Annette. It encompassed a resolute quest for justice on behalf of Will's sister, Mary Horton, as well. Never let go of hope that maybe, maybe, maybe people, somebody would believe what I knew to be true. However, before justice could be obtained for the two women and before the police could be fully engaged, Mary recognized the necessity for more tangible evidence beyond mere statements. Fortunately, she was no longer alone in her battle for justice. Upon understanding the complexities of Annette's story, Will gained a clear understanding of the situation and provided Mary with a particularly intriguing piece of information. Will disclosed to Mary that he had been receiving numerous calls since 1975, inquiring about a girl who had disappeared from Sulphur, Louisiana in 1973. To compound the eeriness of the situation, the girl in question was none other than Sharon Hensley, who happened to be Felix's girlfriend after Mary Horton. Her mother called for years, wondering if anyone had seen Sharon. When she told me that, my ears perked up. I thought, oh my gosh, now I've got something to work with. Embarking on a new journey in her quest for information, Mary Rose now set her sights on a different destination. In 1994, she traveled to Bismarck, North Dakota to meet with Brian Hensley, Sharon's brother. Fondest memories of my sister Sharon are just the sunshine and beads and a lot of people describe her as a free spirit. Sharon Hensley, born on December 20, 1948, left her home in Bismarck, North Dakota during the summer of 1970 with dreams of peace and love. She aimed to embrace a new life joining other free-spirited individuals who were shaping their journey in the wake of the famous Summer of Love. San Francisco beckoned as the ultimate destination for Hensley. She succeeded in reaching her goal. However, the reality that awaited her was a far cry from the picturesque existence she had envisioned in her North Dakota haven. Instead, her path led her to Felix Vale. Living from vineyard to vineyard, living on grapes and kind of uh, freewheeling around. During that time following the passing of his first wife, Felix delved into a hippie lifestyle, embracing a transient existence. He even took on the role of a wandering preacher, and during this phase he established his own personal cult, known as the Holy Order of Mans. It was within this period that 21-year-old Sharon met Felix. Two years after her departure in 1972, Sharon returned to her parents' home in Bismarck, accompanied by her new boyfriend, Felix Vale. However, something had changed in their daughter, the once energetic girl from North Dakota who enjoyed dancing and spending time with friends, now appeared to be distant. Her independence seemed to be eclipsed by her new boyfriend's influence, much to her parents' concern. I think he said exactly what she wanted to hear. The meeting left her parents uneasy, but Sharon, being an adult, chose to depart with Felix. She held the autonomy to make her own decisions. Nonetheless, her parents' worries intensified. They held the belief that Felix was leading their daughter into a troubling lifestyle, one marked by drug use and reckless behavior. However, even they couldn't have foreseen what lay ahead in the future. Sharon soon became a member of the Holy Order of Mans, engaging with the group for a brief duration. However, her involvement coincided with a stark shift in circumstances. Felix's behavior underwent a transformation turning increasingly violent and domineering while his drug consumption escalated progressively. At that point, I believe she was with him out of fear. She didn't know how to get out of the situation. Sharon was on the brink of departing for South America alongside Felix. However, before embarking on this journey, she made a final call to her mother to bid her farewell. Yet her mother couldn't ignore the unsettling feeling that something was amiss. My mom got off the phone. She told my dad, Sharon's in deep trouble. She's crying out for help. After that last contact, no calls or letters arrived from Sharon. She vanished without a trace in 1973. Felix communicated with Sharon's family through a letter, asserting that he had last seen her in Key West. According to his account, she had left him and set out on a journey with an Australian couple to sail around the world. Yet just as was the recurring theme in all these cases, the Hensley family had doubts regarding everything Felix said. The letter that we received from Felix was just bizarre. I remember plainly, clearly, just like, oh my God, this is such BS. 
Sharon's family filed a missing persons report in February 1973, but unfortunately the police did not take any action for an entire year. Even though there weren't immediate investigations or initial police support, an old newspaper report filled the gap. The old newspaper report piqued Brian Hensley's interest. The news article was from 1970, about an arrest report of Sharon and Felix. The report stated that a young boy around the age of eight appeared at the police station, seeking assistance to be taken back to his home. The child turned out to be none other than Bill Vale, the son of Mary Horton, and Felix Vale. So Bill went no shoes, no socks to the police station and said, my daddy's making me smoke marijuana and he'd take LSD and I want to go home. The police discovered that without the knowledge of the Horton family, Felix had taken Bill with him when he left for California after Mary Horton's death. From that point on, Bill was compelled to accompany his troubled father wherever he went. The police also learned that Bill had suffered from violence during this time until he managed to run away and find his way to the police station. Felix and Sharon were arrested for child endangerment. However, how the two got free is not known. Upon learning from Sharon's brother, Mary Rose resolved to meet with Bill Vale. She believed that Bill had valuable information about Felix's location, making him a potential source of crucial details. Driven by this intention, Mary embarked on a journey to Kansas to meet with Bill and his family. Bill Vale was very open. He was very kind to me, compassionate. He was a good man. And I realized he was petrified of his dad. At first, Bill was hesitant to divulge extensive information, as he feared the sharing details might inadvertently bring Felix closer to his own wife and children. Nevertheless, his desire to assist Mary and secure justice for his mother prevailed. Bill recognized the significance of this opportunity and chose not to let it slip away. Building up some courage, he revealed the hidden secrets that could prove Mary right. Bill recounted a pivotal moment from 1970, just before he fled and reached the police station. He had inadvertently overheard a conversation between his father, Felix, and Sharon. He told her that he had murdered my mother. And, and I heard the, the girlfriend saying, Oh, I know you must just feel responsible for it. You know, you just, you just feel responsible. He said, no, you don't understand. I, I really did kill her. Following the arrest of Sharon and Felix in 1970, Bill found refuge with his grandparents, which marked a significant transformation in his life. Despite this change, his fear of his father persisted, especially as he was compelled to testify against him in court during the trials. This anxiety heightened, as he dreaded the possibility of his father's return, and tragically, Felix did reappear. In 1975, Felix came to Bill's residence asserting that he solely wanted to see his son. Bill was gripped by fear, but what made his fear stronger was the absence of Sharon who was no longer with Felix. He was about 13. He said she would never bother anyone ever again. And I knew what that meant. There was nothing I could do with his information. I, I just remember being so angry again that he had told me this, and there was not a soul I could tell about it. Bill grappled with the fear that Felix might inflict harm upon his family if he divulged these revelations, yet his determination for justice was more powerful. Tragically, Bill's life was cut short by cancer in 2009, preventing him from witnessing the realization of justice for his mother. However, before his passing, Bill took meticulous steps to ensure his account of Felix's confession was documented. He engaged his local preacher to record his narrative, safeguarding the truth for posterity. He wanted the truth to come out here for the victims. He knew what he had heard, and he never wavered on that, never. He called me, and it was very close to the end, and he said, at least now I'll get to see my... After years of relentless investigation, Mary finally sensed that she possessed something substantial enough to urge the FBI to reopen the case. Even though she was aware of the absence of concrete physical evidence, she held on to the conviction that the collective testimony of the Hortons, Sharon's brother, Felix's son Bill, and herself could potentially provide the ammunition needed to fight for justice on behalf of her daughter. had a special agent there that was working on serial killers and cold cases. He told me, I believe you're absolutely right. We are dealing with a serial killer. 
Tragically, the agent who'd shown belief in Mary's cause was let go due to budget constraints, and the cold case department bore the brunt of the cutbacks. This unfortunate turn of events left no avenue for Mary's request to be pursued. She found herself right back where she started. I felt shame that I had gotten all the families excited about this, so it was a bit big a letdown for me. However, the families who had faith in her knew she would not stop. Even though things fizzled out, she continued to search for someone to take a look at our situation. She just had that burning desire to want to get this guy so bad. She was consumed with it. Meanwhile, Mary's resolve to fight for justice had taken a toll on her over the span of nearly 30 long years, gradually wearing her down. Almost three decades without the net. I continued just doing my life and I realized then, I need help. I need some healing here. In June 2011, while listening to the radio, Mary learned about an investigator who had successfully resolved eight murder cases related to the notorious Burning Mississippi murders orchestrated by the Ku Klux Klan. These cases had remained unsolved for a half a century until he managed to crack them. Hearing about this gave Mary another push that she needed. I was just sitting in my living room listening, and I realized, oh my gosh, this man is not afraid of cold cases. I need to contact him. Without delay, Mary embarked on a mission to obtain his contact information. Fortunately, she succeeded in locating his number. This individual, a resident of Mississippi, was Jerry Mitchell. Said Jerry, if you knew there was a serial killer living in Mississippi as a free man, would you be interested in the case? And Jerry's answer was simple. Well, yeah. And so she proceeds to tell me about Felix Vale. After briefing Jerry on the case, Mary discovered that Felix had relocated to Mississippi. Faced with this revelation, Mary confronted a straightforward decision that she needed to make. She said, I'm coming down to confront Felix. I said, well, I want to go with you. In 2011, the two of them journeyed to Mississippi and arrived at the pivotal location, a secluded and desolate trailer park. By now, I'm starting to get kind of suspicious about you know, where is he? Is he watching? You know, I'm, I'm thinking along those lines. However, 64-year-old Mary was least bothered. All she wanted was to end the chapter of Felix Vale. She gets over there, and the back window was missing. So she crawled inside. You didn't worry about the risks? I don't worry about the risk. I just wanted to know the truth. And she threw out a machete. And then she threw out another machete, then another machete, then another machete. And I'm like, what in the world have I gotten myself into? As Mary emerged from the house, she and Jerry noticed an individual rushing in their direction. Yet it wasn't Felix Vale. Instead, it was his sister, Kay Faulkner. At first, Kay was incensed by their unexpected presence, but her anger quickly subsided upon learning the purpose of Mary and Jerry Mitchell's visit. I spoke to Kay Faulkner, Felix Vale's sister. She's like, oh yeah. I think he killed these women. Recognizing the rapid progress achieved merely a day into the investigation, Jerry Mitchell capitalized on the momentum without delay. He proceeded to interview the Hortons, Hensleys, and Mary Rose, resulting in the publication of a book titled Gone in 2015, a mere four years later. This book carefully recorded the stories and experiences of the families. It quickly gained significant praise and received multiple awards. This development caught the attention of the FBI, who, comprehending the intricate details, made the decision to reopen the case. After a prolonged period of struggle, Mary finally experienced a sense of genuine happiness. I celebrated. I danced. I remember calling one of my brothers and said, Fred, I've got some good news. They said, Mary, that's not good news. That's fabulous news. The FBI meticulously reviewed all available information and opted to prioritize Mary Horton's case primarily because her death was confirmed, unlike Sharon and Annette, whose bodies were never found. However, the challenge lay in the fact that this case dated back around more than 50 years, causing reports and data to be lost over time. Nevertheless, the FBI persisted in their efforts, even as they sought a district attorney willing to tackle this complex and antiquated case. And they finally found the right person for the job. It was Hugh Holland. 
I was minding my own business, walking down the hall to get some coffee, and the DA grabbed me and said, hey, how would you like to work on a 50-year-old murder case? And foolishly, I told him I would do it. Hugh Holland wasted no time and swiftly deployed a squad to raid Felix's residence as the initial step. We found Felix Vale's journals, almost 2,500 pages worth. And so in reading through the journals, Felix clearly tried to control every woman in his life. And a lot of times through physical violence. In the journals, Felix described how he even liked to drink raw blood. However, nothing related to the murders was there. Now Holland decided to find someone who would know anything about the Calcasieu incident in 1962, where Mary Horton had drowned. And surprisingly, they found a man. He was 90-year-old Isaac Abshire. Ike Abshire was a roommate with Felix Vale when Felix Vale lived in Lake Charles. Ike's father, ironically enough, owned a large boat. The sheriff's office hired Ike's fathers as part of the search party to look for Mary's body. Ike happened to be on his father's boat when Mary's body was recovered. During their meeting, as Holland conversed with Abshire, who was confined to a wheelchair, Abshire handed him an envelope. And on the envelope is a single word, key, K-E-E-P. Open up the envelope, and then I'll pull these two photographs out. The contents of the envelope turned out to be photographs depicting Mary Horton's body on the day of its discovery, revealing extensive bruising and injuries. Holland took a hold of the photographs and commenced his examination when he finally got the conclusion. As a pathologist just happens to be walking past the table, he looks down at the pictures, he said, who murdered her? And I said, okay, well, we got us a murder case now. Armed with substantial evidence and the necessary proof, Holland swiftly pressed charges against 76-year-old Felix Vale for the murder of his first wife, Mary Horton. In a fitting twist of fate, the very place where the saga had begun, Louisiana, also became the site where it finally reached its conclusion. In 2014, this marked the moment of reckoning, as Felix was apprehended and arrested. Felix, what happened to Mary? What about Sharon? Annette? Felix, did you murder those women? Throughout the trial, Sharon and Annette's disappearances were also highlighted. Vale was, after all, the last person to see them both. Recognizing the pivotal role of Abshire's testimony in the case, Holland requested Abshire to provide his testimony, acknowledging its significance as the most crucial piece of evidence in the entire proceedings. Without him, without his testimony introduced in the photos, I can't prove it's a murder. Ike Abshire was the key to the entire case. She had a scarf wrapped around her mouth and her neck, and her neck was all swollen around like it was sunk in. It looked like a big old knot, but it wasn't a woman's knot. Merely three months after delivering his testimony, Isaac Abshire passed away on May 17, 2014, due to old age at his residence. Nonetheless, his testimony proved to be a decisive factor that dispelled all doubts during the court proceedings. It just took the jury approximately 10 minutes to get the final decision. Felix Vale was found guilty and was sentenced to life imprisonment. Mary was sitting next to me and Brian was sitting next to Mary and we were holding hands. We've become a family. The best part of this whole ordeal was getting to meet Mary Rose and getting to meet Will. And when they said guilty, it, it was really no words to describe it. It just felt so good. Finally, mission accomplished. While Felix's involvement in Annette's and Sharon's disappearance was not definitively established, Mary and Brian found a sense of peace in the fact that he was held accountable for his actions and finally received the justice he deserved. The most important thing for me was that he was be convicted of murder, whether it was just for Mary Horton or all three women, and that he would serve the rest of his life in prison. This was it. He was never going to get out of jail. As far as for Sharon, I was able to have a memorial service for my sister, and it felt so good. I felt like I, I, I fulfilled a promise to my mom. With Felix incarcerated and justice achieved, Mary's relentless pursuit was vindicated. Nevertheless, the emotional wound in her heart remained unhealed, a reminder of the enduring pain she had endured. Seeking solace from her lingering guilt of having left her daughter due to work, Mary found a coping mechanism in writing letters, as though they were intended for Annette to read. 
with a hope that one day she would finally be able to forgive herself. I don't really know exactly what closure means. I haven't found Annette's body. There's always going to be a, a piece of me that my heart is always going to be broken. Dear Annette, I want you to know that I'm all right. Life has been challenging and painful since you went away. The night was restless and full of ruminating about all the mistakes that I made around you and Felix, but I can't go back. I finally, and with gratitude, can weep thinking of it all. So sad that maybe my choices would have made a difference and saved your precious life. I feel like I've been suppressing tears for so many years as I've kept myself busy trying to find justice. But now the tears are flowing and they feel heavy and deep and old and very salty as though I've been holding them inside for all this time and and now they can come out and I can weep and feel sad and it's okay. It's okay. So what are your thoughts on this case? What could have Felix done to Sharon and Annette? Share your thoughts. We'd love to hear from you. This is the most horrific crime that I had ever seen. The case that cannot be forgotten. Oh, God. <laughs> On August 28, 2014, 32-year-old Timothy Ray Jones Jr. committed an unthinkable act. Now, this next case is very unique, both in terms of its details and the legal question on mental illness. In their family mobile home on South Lake Drive in Red Bank, New Jersey, Timothy took the lives of his five children, aged one to eight. What could have caused this father to kill his own children? Red Bank is a neighborhood in Monmouth County in the U.S. state of New Jersey. The Navasink River, the region's traditional means of transit to the ocean and other ports, runs through the community which was incorporated in 1908. Red Bank is a commuter town for New York City and is located in the metropolitan area of New York. The borough has a population of 12,936 as of the 2020 United States Census. It was in this neighborhood that five young children met their end in the most horrific manner in August 2014. Timothy Jones Jr. was born in 1981 to Timothy Jones Sr. and Cindy Jones, who was 16 at the time of her pregnancy. Sadly, Cindy left the house when Jones Jr. was only 18 months old. Following this, Timothy Jones Sr. remarried. Growing up, Jones Jr. faced legal trouble in 2001 when he was arrested in Illinois on charges of possessing cocaine, forging checks, and car theft. Despite being sentenced to seven years in prison, he was released in 2003 after serving just two years. After this, his life seemed to take a turn for the better. He and Amber Kaiser had met as teenagers, and they got married in 2004. They soon had three children. Jones continued his education, eventually getting an engineering degree and graduating from Mississippi State University. The young family later moved to Blythewood, seeking better opportunities of life. By 2014, they had five children who were eight-year-old Mara Gracie, seven-year-old Elias, six-year-old Nathan, two-year-old Gabrielle, and one-year-old Abigail Elaine. As time went on, their marriage began to falter, and Jones' behavior changed drastically as he turned to drinking, smoking, and using synthetic marijuana. Amidst these challenges, Amber gave birth to their last child, Abigail Elaine. However, Jones had doubts about whether he was the father of the child, due to this and other problems in their marriage. Jones and Amber got divorced in 2013. After the divorce, Jones won custody of the children. Tim and I had a lot of good times. It just becomes a point when things are volatile that you just make a choice. Where your young children aren't seeing certain things, it, it's affecting them at a point. And you make a choice to separate yourself from that person. And it's hard to separate yourself from that person because that's all you've known. All I knew from 19 was Tim. It was expected that Jones would be the model father and give his all to protect his children. But who could have predicted the horror that would come later? On Thursday, August 28, 2014, Jones picked up his three older children from school and the two youngest from their babysitter. He vanished the very next day. Jones and the children were gone for several days, prompting his family to reach out to the police. 
but only after they were unable to get in touch with him for several days. At 9.36 a.m. the next day, the babysitter Elk tried reaching him on the phone, but received no response. Unfazed, Elk decided to text Jones at 9.38, inquiring about dropping off the youngest children at daycare. Jones responded, Don't worry about this morning. I'll see you next week. He assured her that the children would return on Tuesday, the day following Memorial Day. Meanwhile, Jones's grandmother, Roberta Thornsbury, desperately tried to reach him from Mississippi, but he declined her calls. On August 30th, Thornsbury grew increasingly concerned and sent a series of texts to Jones throughout the day, finally questioning him at 5.13 p.m. about his unresponsiveness. At 4.54 p.m., Elk gently reminded Jones to bring diapers when dropping off Gabriel and Abigail Elaine on September 1st. Later at 6.15 p.m., he made a call to Elk revealing his intentions to leave South Carolina with the children and start afresh. He asked Elk to clean up his mobile home and offered her whatever she wanted from the things he left behind. At 7 p.m., a call from Amber came in, but Jones didn't answer. Tim, I'm not, I'm not calling to argue or anything. I just... So, like, the past two or three phone calls, you've been, like, really on the edge. I'm saying you're, like, coming off really frustrated or whatever. And I was just concerned about you, so. Please call. I'm not, not calling to argue or anything. His family reached out to the police as they couldn't reach him. A nationwide alert was released looking for Jones and indicated that he was missing and traveling with his five children. But it wouldn't be until September 6th that they received news on his whereabouts. On September 6, 2014, a routine traffic safety stop in Smith County, Mississippi, led to a shocking discovery. Tim Jones Jr. was detained at around 7 p.m. Under Sheriff Marty Patterson went to the scene around 8 p.m. He noticed that Jones showed signs of intoxication as he approached Jones's car. An Escalade emitted a foul stench. Bleach stains along the baseboard caught Patterson's attention. Running Jones' ID and license plate revealed an alarming hit from the FBI's National Crime Information Center, indicating that Jones was supposed to be traveling from Lexington with his five children. Patterson immediately contacted the Lexington County Sheriff's Department. We did advise you of your, your rights, is that correct? Yes, sir. All right, can you just state your name? Tim Jones. When questioned about his children, Jones initially denied having any, but when pressed further, he claimed to have only three children in South Carolina. Smith County investigators promptly reached out to Jones's father, Tim Jones Sr., who then informed Jones's grandmother, Roberta Thornsbury, and Amber, Jones's ex-wife. On September 8, 2014, investigative officers from the Lexington County Sheriff's Department and SLED arrived in Mississippi to delve into the case. Two days later, on September 9th, Jones agreed to lead investigators to the bodies of his children. The discovery unfolded on September 10th when the bodies of Marag Gracie, Elias, Nathan, Gabriel, and Abigail Elaine were recovered. The evidence collected from Jones's Escalade on September 11th was disturbing and haunting. Among the items logged were family photos, clothing, drawings made by the children, letters to the children penned by their mother, Amber, Bibles, Tim Jones's diploma from Mississippi State University, and his passport. Equally chilling were handwritten notes by Timothy Jones, containing lists of disturbing tasks, such as melt bodies, sand bones to dust or small pieces, and burn up bodies. The list also included items needed for these horrifying acts, such as camping supplies, gas, and M. Acid. It seemed unbelievable that this father had meticulously planned to kill and dispose of the bodies of all five of his children. On September 13, 2014, Jones was booked into Kirkland Correctional Facility where he was placed in solitary confinement, away from the general population. But what had transpired on that fateful day? Why did Jones kill the children, and what prompted him to hide their bodies? Jones's confession and the police's investigation led them to the dark truth of what Jones did in the week when he disappeared with his children. The afternoon of Thursday, August 28, 2014, set the stage for the chilling chain of events. Tim Jones picked up his three older children from school and retrieved his two youngest from the babysitter. Little did anyone know that this seemingly ordinary day would take a nightmarish turn. Before 7 p.m., a storm of anger engulfed the family's mobile home. Jones confronted his six-year-old son, Nathan, about damaged power outlets. 
He beat Nathan and subjected the child to a punishing physical ordeal. Jones went further to rain down a barrage of questions on the young child. At 7.10 p.m., there was a phone call from his estranged wife, Amber. Nathan, in fear and distress, revealed that the incident had been an accident. But Jones intervened, accusing Amber of protecting their son before abruptly ending the conversation. As the evening wore on, the darkness deepened. Nathan was sent to bed, and Amber's desperate attempts to reach out went unanswered. The details here were unclear, but around 8.30 p.m., Jones either discovered Nathan's lifeless body or attempted to ruse the boy to no avail. Jones faced the grim reality that his child was gone forever. Jones, seemingly triggered by his own imagination, would later claim to the authorities that Nathan was trying to harm him through the mobile home's electricity. This paranoia pushed him to kill his children. In the early hours of the following day, Jones took his eight-year-old daughter, Mara to a convenience store to buy cigarettes. Upon returning home, a wave of violence consumed him. In his confession to the authorities, Jones admitted to choking Mara and Elias, aged eight and seven, with his bare hands. While using a belt to end the lives of Gabriel and Abigail Elaine, he then wrapped the bodies of his children in sheets and blankets from their beds, before placing them in the back seat of his vehicle. The authorities also went through Jones's search history and revealed an unusual interest in herbal incense and Atlanta. It became apparent that Jones was on the hunt for spice, a synthetic marijuana that happened to be legal in South Carolina but banned in Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi. Determined to get his hands on the substance, he scoured the internet for smoke shops or head shops across state borders. Around this time, he also declined calls from his grandmother, who he had made prior plans with. She had left up to 23 calls and texts. Tracking data suggested Jones's presence near Moody, Alabama at 2.20 p.m. In the late afternoon, between 3 and 5 p.m., Jones continued his search for smoke shops, this time focusing on Alabama and Mississippi. As the day progressed, Jones's location hopped from Lithium Springs, Georgia at 8.04 p.m. to Washington, Georgia at 10.29 p.m. It was clear that he was covering considerable ground. By August 30th, the location of Jones's phone indicated that he was in Red Bank. By August 31st, the search queries on Jones's phone revealed his plans to start anew. He looked up camping options in South Carolina, dumps in Lexington County, and animal services. On September 1st, a store receipt found in Jones's vehicle put him in Athens, Georgia. Surprisingly, data from his phone also indicated his presence in Spartansburg and Winsboro. At 1.20 a.m. that same day, the phone's location switched to Folly Beach. The situation took a darker turn on September 2nd at 10.35 a.m. When Jones conducted a series of concerning Google searches, he looked up body in landfill, muriatic acid burn, camping near Columbia, South Carolina, what does no extradition laws mean, and facing legal problems, where should you run? The phone was traced to West Columbia between 11 a.m. and noon. Jones and Elk exchanged texts about arrangements to clean his Red Bank mobile home. At 11.54 a.m., Jones's boss, Intel, Jim McConnell, reached out to inquire about his absence from work. Additionally, there were unanswered calls from Sachs Gotha School regarding Mara, Elias, and Nathan around 1.30 p.m. The situation escalated as an unanswered call from McConnell followed at 1.53 p.m. The phone's location was further traced to Clinton, South Carolina at 3.22 p.m., Athens, Georgia at 4.19 p.m., and Lawrenceville, Georgia at 6.04 p.m. Throughout this tumultuous day, Jones ignored two calls from Amber at 6 p.m. and received an update call from Elk at 10.08 p.m. By September 3rd, the situation had grown concerning. Jones missed two calls in an unanswered text from Kevin McKinney, a co-worker at Intel, at 10.07 a.m. Additionally, his boss call at 12.11 p.m. went unanswered too. Surveillance footage from various locations on September 3rd spotted Jones at the Augusta Road Walmart in Lexington, an advanced auto store in Lake City, and a Dollar General in Orangeburg. Disturbingly, the Walmart footage showed him purchasing items like a saw, saw blades, muriatic acid, garbage bags, a five-gallon bucket, and goggles. On September 4th at 3.37 a.m., when the phone powered on again, Jones googled missing children Tim Jones and the phone was traced to James Island near Charleston. 
Later that day, Thornsbury and Sachs got this text went unanswered, and Jones's phone was traced to Camden and then Orangeburg at 5.17 p.m. At 6.33 p.m., Jones was spotted using the Augusta Road ATM in Lexington, depositing a check for $3,518.49. This money revealed to be proceeds from Intel stock he sold weeks prior. The climax occurred on September 6. Jones would reveal to the authorities that he placed the decomposing bodies of his children in black plastic garbage bags along a logging road between Greenville and Camden, Alabama. The bodies had been in the back seat of his vehicle since August 29, 2014. At 9.14 a.m., the phone was located in Greenville, Alabama. Receipts and surveillance video from the same day showed Jones at the Bypass Food Mart in Camden, Alabama at 1.06 p.m. It is unusual for a father to commit such an act. This made the authorities seek to understand what pushed Tim to kill the children. Hence, an investigation was launched to verify his mental state. In the wake of his incarceration, mental health professionals closely examined Tim Jones Jr.'s psychological state. Clinical and forensic psychiatrists and psychologists were involved in the evaluation, but there were disagreement among them regarding his diagnosis. While others suggested he may have a schizoaffective disorder or a personality disorder, additionally they debated whether his mental state during the crime could have been influenced by the use of synthetic marijuana or if a traumatic brain injury he suffered at age 15 played a role in underlying psychosis. These varying theories were presented to the jury during the trial. To shed light on the roots of Tim Jones Jr.'s mental state, the history of the Jones family spanning three generations was diagrammed and explored. The aim was to understand how a turbulent environment and a familial background mental illness could have impacted Tim Jr.'s mental health. During the trial, the jury learned about the circumstances surrounding the conception and birth of Tim Jones Sr., Roberta Thornsbury, Tim Sr.'s mother, had been assaulted by her stepfather, leading to her pregnancy at just 12 years old. Surprisingly, Tim Jr.'s mother, Cynthia, also had a family history of mental illness. Tim Jr. was born when the young couple were barely out of their teens. However, their relationship turned volatile, leading to Cynthia's attempt to take Tim Jr. away from his father. Ultimately, Tim Sr. gained custody, and as a result, Tim Jr. was raised by his grandmother, Roberta Thornsbury. Meanwhile, Tim Sr. had Cynthia confined to a mental hospital in New York after she was diagnosed with schizophrenia. These intricate family dynamics were presented as evidence to help the jury comprehend the complex web of factors that may have contributed to Tim Jones Jr.'s mental state. Thornberry's marriage had its fair share of woes. Numerous incidences of the marriage involved calls to the police for shootings, stabbings, drug possession, and physical and alcohol abuse. The environment seemed anything but stable. As the years passed, Tim Sr. went through multiple marriages, divorcing Cynthia and marrying Carolyn, with whom he had two more sons. By the time Tim was nine, he found himself in a broken family, and as the years went on, he witnessed his father marrying again, this time to a woman called Julie, when Jones was 16. Upon his release, Jones met Amber and the two got married. Jones had a strained relationship with his father, this escalated during the Christmas holidays of 2012, leading to 18 months of silence between them. The Christmas holiday of 2012 would be the last time that Jones's father would see the children. The trial commenced on May 15, 2019. Testimonies poured in from various individuals, shedding light on the heinous crime committed by Jones. Law enforcement officials, mental health experts, correctional officers, teachers, school administrators, babysitters, and even Jones's own family members took the stand to present their accounts. From the onset, Jones's guilt was undeniable. He had confessed to the crime and the evidence against him was overwhelming. Despite this, the defense sought to establish that the man was severely mentally ill and thus not entirely responsible for his actions. However, when the jury delivered the guilty verdict, they unequivocally rejected the defense's argument. With guilt established, the focus shifted to determining the appropriate punishment for the murders. During the sentencing phase, the prosecution called on teachers and former babysitters to describe the trauma inflicted upon them by the loss of these innocent children, even though they were not biologically related. Their accounts painted a picture of the impact of Jones's actions on those left behind. The defense did not present experts to bolster their case, 
but they heavily relied on pleas for mercy from Jones's relatives, who advocated for a life sentence instead of death. Admits the emotionally charged courtroom, Jones's father and grandmother took to the stand, recounting a disturbed adolescence and adulthood of Jones. Their tearful testimonies, however, firmly opposed the idea of him facing the death penalty. On the following day, Amber Kaiser, the mother of the children and Jones's wife, returned to the stand for a second time in the trial. While her first appearance was marked by tears and visible distress, this time she mustered the strength to request mercy for Jones. I pray for Tim all the time. I pray. I pray for him often. I pray for his family often. I pray for my family. They didn't even have the opportunity to know them. I can't bring myself to want anybody to die. Despite her own feelings of wanting to inflict harm on him, she acknowledged her children's sentiments and believed that they would not have wanted their father to die. I hope for mercy for you. I pray for you often. And I say that without excusing what he's done. She bravely expressed her willingness to accept whatever decision the jury would reach. Solicitor Rick Hubbard delivered the closing arguments for the state in the penalty phase of the Timothy Jones Jr. murder trial. Hubbard confronted the jury, posing the striking question, Would you reserve death for the worst of the worst? Isn't he, pointing at Tim Jones, the worst of the worst? Tim Jones, a man who brutally murdered his five children. As Hubbard continued, he implored the jury to consider the kind of man Jones truly was, a murderer who callously betrayed the trust of his own flesh and blood, robbing them of their precious young lives. Reflecting on Jones's tumultuous childhood, Hubbard acknowledged that amidst the chaos, his family had tried to shield him, recognizing something special in him. Jones's father, despite his own imperfections, had loved his son, and his grandmother had expressed her love for him too though also recognizing his selfish tendencies. Hubbard highlighted how Jones had learned to manipulate his family, knowing that they would always come to him and apologize, reinforcing a sense of entitlement. Hubbard showed two pictures. The first was one of Jones's joyful family, and the second was the children's lifeless bodies wrapped in black garbage bags. Hubbard drove home the point that Jones was responsible for destroying this loving family. He declared, No father does this to his children. Hubbard highlighted that Jones's choices, not his family history, led to the tragic act of leaving his children's bodies exposed. With a display of crime scene and autopsy photos, Hubbard challenged the jury to confront the reality of Jones's actions. Throughout his closing arguments, Hubbard pressed the jury to contemplate whether a man who committed such an unfathomable act deserved mercy. With the weight of the evidence and the gravity of the crime before them, the jury was left to determine the fate of Jones. Jones's attorney, Casey Secor, passionately appealed to the jury's empathy for the Jones family. He prompted them to consider the family's ongoing suffering and heartache. Secor acknowledged the gravity of Jones's actions, urging a balanced decision that respected both severe punishment and compassion. It took the jury just over six hours to find Jones guilty. Despite the gravity of the situation, Jones chose not to testify in his defense during either the guilt or penalty phase. Instead, the courtroom was exposed to a haunting audio confession from 2014 that left no room for doubt. After just an hour and 45 minutes of intense deliberation, the 12-member panel delivered their verdict. The death penalty was not an automatic consequence in this case. The jurors carefully considered any extenuating circumstances before reaching their unanimous decision to condemn Jones to death. All 12 jurors had to be in agreement and signed the verdict form before the judge formally delivered the death sentence. As the Jones family solemnly exited the courthouse, they remained tight-lipped, offering no comment to the press, but this would not be the end of the case. In 2021, two years after receiving a death sentence, Jones sought a new trial and the removal of his death penalty, claiming that the exposure to distressing autopsy photos during the original trial prejudiced jurors against him. Lawyer Robert Dudek argued that Jones, who suffers from schizophrenia, was unfairly judged. The defense contended that the inclusion of gruesome autopsy images skewed the sentencing against Jones and that prosecutors misrepresented the consequences of an insanity plea. These images, taken nine days after the children's deaths, raised concerns about fairness. The defense also objected to excluding expert witness testimony, challenging Jones's mental health and diagnosis. Solicitor Rick Hubbard defended his decision to include the photos, 
facing criticism from justices for potentially manipulating the jurors' emotions. The court usually permits strong defense arguments in death penalty cases, but concerns were raised about the trial's handling. However, in March 2023, the South Carolina Supreme Court rejected Jones's appeal. The court acknowledged that two errors were made during the trial, but deemed them harmless errors. That didn't warrant overturning the conviction or sentence. The initial mistake was excluding Dr. Adriana Flores' testimony, meant to challenge another doctor's claims about Jones faking mental issues. The court said her input should have been allowed. The second error involved showing disturbing autopsy photos. Despite this, the court noted Jones tried to hide the crime, so the images didn't greatly affect the juror's death penalty decision. We, the jury, in the above entitled case, have found beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the following statutory aggravating circumstances, to wit, two or more persons were murdered by the defendant by act or pursuant to one scheme or course of conduct, and the murder of five children 11 years of age or younger. Now I recommend to the court that the defendant, Timothy R. Jones, Jr., <clears throat> be sentenced to death. The emotions within Jones's family must have been unimaginable. Losing all five children and facing the possibility of Jones's execution must be a heavy burden to bear. The prosecutors and defense attorneys, tasked with debating through the horrors of the case, are surely haunted by the disturbing images and Jones's own confession. And above all, the children's mother, who has endured indescribable pain since that fateful day on August 28, 2014. Would she be able to pick up the pieces and start again?